The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies and also by the generous donations of you, the listener. A huge thank you goes to Chris Robinson, Marcus Wheeler, Glenn Oberhauser, David Chakowsin, Alex McIntosh, John, and Tobias Whiting. Guys, thank you all so much for your generous donations. Take one 5XL sized Brummy, combine with a tall silver haired Yorkshireman, and then mix well with a small but perfectly formed Welsh wizard. Bring the mixture slowly to the boil and simmer for three hours ish. Is this the recipe for the perfect podcast? Continue listening and find out. It's Meeples and Miniatures. Hello and welcome once again to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. This is episode 168. Uh, my name's Neil Shuck and once again I'm joined by my partners in crime, uh, Mr. Mike Hobbs. Hello. Well, South Wales is finest. How are you, mate? Oh, okay. That was How the good voice. <laughs> <laughs> and that voice you heard, just, ha- just having to go there... Was Mr. Mike Whittaker, <laughs> also, also of, also of this parish? <laughs> no, actually, of a different parish to you. How well, is the voice? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jason Statham's very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I, I, I was going for the poor man's Barry White after my introduction last <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wasn't quite that bad. Uh, uh, although, all having said that, anybody heard me um, on the introduction of uh, episode one sixty seven? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm still well. I'm, I'm better than I was on, uh, earlier in the week when I recorded that, but I'm not well. <laughs> but let's just say that my immediate reaction on hearing that was to reach for a phone and text me and say, "My God, mate, you sound rough." <laughs> It was amazing. Only be <laughs> yes, I, uh, I must admit, I did, I did quite also like Mister Mister Hobbs's um, Twitter quote, first Twitter quote was, "Who on earth is introducing our episode? <laughs> <laughs> Who is introducing our episode anyway? What's it about?" Yeah. Uh, oh, excellent question. Well presented. I um, thought so. Indeed. I- Tell you what, Neil, why don't you rest your voice and let me and Mike take over for the next twenty minutes? Oh, I see. Oh, oh, yes, I, see. Okay. I, 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 I see. I see. This is this is all part. This is all part of a cunning plan. Some some would call it a coup. We we call it the natural progression. So there there is no truth in the rumor that I bribed Merv with some cold virus in the um, cake that you scoffed <laughs> on your own at Hammerhead. Yeah. No, I, no, no, I didn't scoff it at Hammerhead. I scoffed it at, after Hammerhead. It took me a week. Its own punishment, clearly. Yeah, I was rationing myself. You just <laughs> yes. sat there in a corner eating cake, didn't you, going, oh, I'm a dirty boy, I'm a dirty boy. <laughs> <laughs> in, that, uh, ow, in that case, guys, what have we got in store for us this week? Well, um, we have the return of the mailbag, since we've actually now got a <laughs> backlog, because we haven't done a mailbag in three Hello. episodes, at least. Yeah. yeah. And we have a guest. We do. And we also have our usual news items and what we've been up to. Hobsy, when I say we have a guest, you're supposed to follow up by saying who the guest is. We have to oh, work on this if we want to take oh, over this okay. podcast. Uh, you see, you see, you see this, is, again, this, is, this, is, this is this is the problem when, you know, we get... Uh, I mean, I mean, how long have you guys been doing this? He's going to say amateurs, isn't he? Hobsy, we also have a guest. That's right. Uh, we got 
Annie Norman, a.k.a. the Dice Bag Lady, a.k.a. the owner of Bad Squizzo Games. A.k.a. the person who always beats you at war games. That is very true. Although I haven't played it all year. I wonder why that is. Because I keep losing. <laughs> there you go, then. <laughs> after, after, after the last show, I have encouraged her that it, it, it would be only only fair of her to uh, um, to get involved in in the ponyonics so she can help you play testing. Absolutely. No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> She's far too busy setting up her, you know, her massive um, global business that she can tell us all about later. You know, I, I, I wouldn't want to um, intrude or interrupt. Indeed. Indeed. Yes, but uh, as, as you say, after after the last show, and 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 congratulations if you got to the end of the last show. Yeah, it was it, it was. Uh, well, I, I hope you enjoyed it, and 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 you agree that you know it was worth keeping all the, uh, uh, um or every minute of the interview in. But as you say, this this time around, we have the return of the hobby news and uh, and and uh, what we've been up to, and we'll be catching up on everything that we didn't talk about last time around because we didn't have time. No, <clears throat> we had to sleep. Tell <laughs> me about it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a late one. It was a late one. So, anyway, after a short pause for a word from our sponsors, we'll be right back with what we did last week. Month. At least. <laughs> Eagles have gone. Britain lies defenseless in a cruel world. Since the birth of our Lord, it has been 456 years. What sin? Have we committed to bring this punishment to Britain? I speak, of course, of the Saxons. They came as allies, but now they seek conquest. The lands of the Britons lie ravaged before them. Blood runs red in our island. We need a leader to stand in them. We need a man to bring together the Britons in common cause. We seek a Dux Britanniarum. Right, that's enough of that. Ducks Britannia are in from two fat lardies. They really are very good. What have we been playing? What have we been buying? We might even have painted something. The Meeples and Miniatures crew reveal all. Okay, it's that time of the show again when we get to chat about everything we've been doing in the hobby. And of course, this time around, we got we got oh, a whole month to catch up on since uh, since we really didn't have time last time. So, who who wants to start? Whose turn is it? Well, it's good. well Mr. Whittaker's, isn't it? Yeah, this, this tag turn. might. No, it's not your. It's not always your turn. <laughs> All right. Go on, get on with it. Ah, <laughs> uh, so what? What have I been doing? Went to Hammerhead. Mm-hmm. Met this new shock bloke. Oh, I don't... Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are we doing? So, basically, spent most of my time wandering around the table handing out Heriwood Show flyers. Walked about five miles, according to the pedometer. <laughs> Club put on a interesting Cold War... Um, Cold War flippers of doom. The, the strange tale of Captain Buster Crab, who really existed... And apparently, 
depending on which story you believe, after a raid to plant a listening device on a Russian warship that was docked in Portsmouth Harbour, variously died of the bends, was shot as a Russian spy, was shot as a Russian double agent, was shot by accident by one of his teammates, and about three other things. So it, it's, it's all good fun. Uh, people seem to like it. It's quite good fun. Um, other than that, oh, I bought um, Annie's Shield Maidens, um, Annie's Cartamandua figure, a set of deer and wild boar from war bases, some rather nice, very Roman-looking ruins from Caliva stroke PMC Games, and Kirtley Miniatures' really rather nice Romano-British church, of which I have painted the stag. Oh, all right, so not a very big hall, then? No, a relatively decent size hall. Cole from our club came away with the last of the um, Adrian's Walls painted longships, which is gorgeous. Um, and I covered madly, and there will be a Duxbury scenario for, for using it in coming soon, I think. Um, other than that, what have I done? We've played about two or three games of Sales of Glory down, down the club. I'm sure we've played something else, and I'm completely blanking on what it was. It wasn't Ducks Brit, because uh, my regular Ducks Brit opponent was poorly. However, usefully, I have a club website here, so I'll find out what I was playing three weeks ago. <laughs> what was I playing three weeks ago? Um, oh, I was playtesting the Hammerhead game, that's right. <laughs> that would explain it. <laughs> and I may even have had um, a game of um, Chain of Command. Mars. Which was... Jolly good fun. Bro- broke out some uh, uh, Russians for a change. First time we've done a Russian front chain of command game in a bit. Um, hobby-wise, as I said, I have painted a stag. Really, honestly, I have painted a figure. Yeah. Go me. I was going to say, you painted something. Yeah, yeah. A, a distinctly um, great advantage wow. of it being a white stag um, for Ooh. slightly mythological purposes is that it was mostly about... Three different colours of spray can, a dry brush of white, and an ink wash. <laughs> uh, it's come out quite well. Um, basically, undercoat it in black, dry, um, spray it again in medium grey from slightly further than the distance you need for uniform coverage, and then do the same from even further away with white. Ink wash it with army paint to soft tone, get out the white and dry brush the highlights again, and then just do the antlers in grey, pick out the tips of the antlers in ivory, um, and base it. It's come out really well, considering it's. It said it's. It's very much a, a quick, quick approximation, but it you know it passes the two foot test. I'm quite pleased with it. Other cool. than that, you're painting again. Yeah. Oh, and I've bought a sizable quantity of 54 millimeter early mid uh, mid period medieval French and British for um, Kirsty's little little do up at the armories. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm still looking for some crossbow men. So if anybody has any Britain's 54 mil um, Agincourt crossbow men, I will pray reasonable prices for them. But not silly uh, ones. Sounds interesting, 54 mil. Well, it's it's the Don Featherstone scenario from Skirmish War Games. And it's, toy soldier, at- it's, toy, it's toy soldiers, isn't it? Yeah, and if you look at the if you look at the description of the fight, it's clearly designed for about a maximum three by two table in twenty eight or twenty five, or with little airfix twenty mil. So on a six by four in fifty four mil with a nice big piece of craft foam for the little bit of castle that sits in the corner. I've even picked up some of the old Timpo um, medieval tents, which will get resprayed a sensible colour. Why well, you didn't like them in baby blue then? <laughs> well, they come in baby blue and bright red. Yes, I know. I, yes, yes, I know. I sold a couple quite recently. <laughs> Not to me, I hope. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Yeah. Um, that would have been weird. No, no. So yeah, like the intent is to the <laughs> so the intent is to to cause every toy soldier collector in the world to scream in horror and spray paint them a proper canvas colour and do a little bit of detailing on those. What, what? you're spray painting Timbo? No. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and and that and a, probably a big, big. It'll be using some of our spare um, foam board, board two two by two tiles. So I shall probably also get a nice, a nice big meat skewer and hanger, an ancient France um, fleur de lis banner on it for the middle of the French camp as well. 
the only problem then becomes figuring out how to do a bombard in 54 mil, which I suspect might require a couple of cotton reels and some coffee stirrers. <laughs> if in doubt, you big just if, coffee stirrers. If in doubt, improvise. Yeah, Indeed. exactly. So yeah, I think that's me. Other than I have, needless to say, been beavering away a bit on the Dux Britanniarum Compendium. We're up past the 30 plus page mark. There's still quite a bit to go. I've had a very generous offer from Derek Hodge of his carefully collated Themes What People Have Asked Rich file, which will go in there as a rules clarification section with a bit of checking back with Rich that he still means this and probably adding a few more questions too, because I think there are people who've said they their club couldn't get into Ducks Brit because they hadn't quite figured out how to interpret the way Rich writes rules. So hopefully the clarifications will help on that score. Mm. Uh, we've got six raid scenarios, uh, possibly more. I've got designs on a couple more and a whole new approach to battles, which should make it a little bit more interesting. And it's all going well. Cool. Excellent stuff. And that's me. Excellent stuff. Shall I go, sh- shall I go next? Go on, then. Yeah. Go on, then. Go on. Right. Okay, well, as I say, so first off, uh, yes, Hammerhead went there on the, uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, cool. Yeah, start of the month. Uh, my first show of the year. Massively impressed with the venue. I've not actually. I, I, I didn't I, go. I didn't go last year. I uh, do like that venue. Uh, so um, it's the first time I've been to that venue, and obviously it's the same venue that it's partisan at uh, this year. Uh, yes, excellent venue. It was like going to Derby Wolves, except it was quiet and there was a lot more light. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really good venue. Uh, really impressed with that, and it was a good show. Yeah, um, lots of games, for good selection of traders. Uh, so got managed to get around, chat with loads of people. Really good show. Spent the grand sum of, um, I think it was ten quid. No, eleven pound. About uh, a tenth of what I did then. Yeah, I, I bought. Um, yes, I bought six pots of paint. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you what, this, this Dave Luff is. He's really rubbing off on you, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Let me, yeah, yeah. Let me explain that by, by what else has been happening in a minute. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, it was no. I mean, it was a case of uh, I knew I didn't want. I mean, I was very tempted by the studio miniatures, uh, not Holy Grail range. But I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for now because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit busy. Uh, as far as painting and stuff is concerned, so uh, so so yeah, d- yeah, didn't actually sp- didn't actually spend a lot, and that's uh, and and the paint I bought was all val- uh, it was all new, it was all Vallejo stuff because I'm I was looking at uh, colours I needed to paint, uh, oat leaf camouflage and uh, US infantry, but we will come back to that at a later date. Uh, so that's all that's all I did at salute. Played, uh, didn't play that many games, played a couple. Said hi to Kirsty and Tim, uh, and say. Got to play another couple of bit, uh, another couple of bits and pieces, uh, but yeah, there was lots of good stuff. Really good show. Very impressed with it. And I'm co- I, I am actually looking forward to Partizan now. I, I think it, I think the, cha- the change of venue might be the shot in the arm that Partizan needs. I think it, uh, I think it all pot- has the potential to completely transform the show. So uh, I, I, will, I am intrigued as to uh, as as to the effect that it will have. So that was that. What else have I been doing? Okay, uh, on the on the gaming front, I I've actually got to play a game. Say it ain't so. <laughs> it, what, y- yes, um, yes. The glider was finished because what Dave did at I mean, what Dave did at Hammerhead was buy decals for his glider. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, uh, the glider was finished, and last week we actually we actually finally finally got to play. Uh, the first game in our sixth airborne campaign, uh, which was Pegasus Bridge, but not quite, uh, because we proxied the buildings and the bridge with building, with buildings and the bridge, well, generic buildings and the bridge, as opposed to. Did you win? Did, <laughs> did I win? I mean, <laughs> yeah, Germans against powers at Pegasus Bridge when, when I spent half the game asleep. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's the middle of the night. <laughs> that'd be a no, then. Um, no, that'd be a no. But it was. Uh, but uh, I mean, to be fair, it was. It was a nice. It was actually a nice way of getting back into Ch- China Command because because the stupid thing is we haven't played for about four or five months, and so whilst 
most of it came back to us straight away. There was a couple of, you know, there's a couple of things which, we, which we, yeah, we had to remind ourselves on. And then there was, there was once, I mean, there was a brilliant incident happened in the middle of the game, which uh, I, I put it on the, I put it an after action report, which is on the blog. And there was a great bit of the game where this, uh, where Major Smith, who, uh, if you read the, um, if you know, if you know the account of the battle, um, he's the guy that turns up having allegedly come back from visiting his girlfriend. He turns up in the middle of the battle w- 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 when the powers have stormed over the bridge, uh, gets caught in the crossfire. His driver got shot, at which point the car went out of control and shot straight forward. Okay, and at which point we discovered that other than tank overruns, there doesn't appear to be any collision rules in the rules of vehicles running into running into infantry at all. And it was like, so it was one of those things of, oh, it, 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 yeah, you go backwards and forwards, go backwards and forwards. And it's one of these classic things of, you know, uh, then having to turn around and turn around and go, okay, well, what are we going to do? And, uh, I mean, he's not on to, uh, he's not on to defend himself, but, uh, I was trying to have a discussion with, about, you know, what we're going to do rules wise with Mr. Luff. He's like trying to knit fog. I tell you, it really is. He's like, oh, I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> Every single time, oh, I don't know what you want to do. Well, what do you think? I was like, I'm asking your piggy opinion. You know, <laughs> what do you think? Oh, I don't know. It's like, oh, uh, yes. Anyway, herding cats, knitting fog, asking Dave Rawls questions. Oh, dear nailing me. jelly to all ball. Indeed, but it was brilliant. Really enjoyed it, and uh, that's of that is obviously now ongoing. On the flip side of that. So what else have I been doing? And basically, it's it, I, I've been painting and making scenery because it was like the week. Uh, like we were meant to play that game uh, the previous week, and then basically Dave cried off because he was ill. Uh, although many people thought he was just crying off because he was running scared. Yeah, right. Uh, well, possibly that he <laughs> sorry, actually sorry. hadn't finished the glider yet. <laughs> well, yes. Anyway, but. I was really pleased because because I was I was looking at the um, I was looking at the map and suddenly realised, hang on a second, I'm missing a machine gun pit. <laughs> it's like, oh heck. Um, so it's one of those things where all of a sudden, excuse me, it's amazing what you can create when you throw together something basically out of MDF coffee stirrers and a bit of household filler. Yeah, Cotton reels. Uh, no, 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 no cotton reels for this. Uh, no, no, a couple of matchsticks. So that's about it. I thought I'd written a blog about it, but I don't think I had. Uh, so I, I shall have to, I, I shall have to do it. But it's, it, we, we made, 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 I basically made it in the same way that we did our trenches and just basically did this, like, this little, um, you know, built this little machine, well, as I say, machine gun pit as if it's a, um, a, pl- a plank line trench emplacement sort of thing. Uh, and I managed to get, get one of those done in about 24 hours. But I ended up doing that, I uh, built another couple. And then, stuff I've been, well, and then I kind of stalled on painting infantry, cause I had like 30 odd to paint. Uh, yeah, four, four, four or five packs of just different bits of pieces, like the officers and NCOs and a, f- a few other guys. And, uh, again, it was just one of these things of, I started by doing production line thing. You know, okay, right, so I'll, I'll paint all the helmets. And then I'll start painting all the uniforms and painted about half a dozen and went, I'm fed up there. And then I've stopped and then broke it down. So, well, okay, I'll paint this group of six or eight and I'll, then I'll paint this group of six or eight and then I'll paint this group of six or eight. And funnily enough, I've then, I've now painted 24 in the space of like seven or eight days. It is, re- it is just really weird. The fact that, yeah, the fact that yeah, just stopping and then going, right, well, okay, I'll concentrate on doing this little group actually meant that that little group has taken like two days to paint and then the other group has taken two days to paint and then the other group has taken two days to paint. And then in, in the middle of all that, I also bought four new buildings from Tiger Terrain, the Normandy Farmhouse and Stone Barn, which are really nice, lovely, really uh, well-defined, very characterful uh, houses in resin. Uh, so... Painted those and also got, got a, uh, a couple of their bar, a couple of barns from their, actually their Waterloo range. Again, really nice, but they're slightly different because what they've done with the Waterloo range is that they scaled it down slightly. So, uh, whilst 
the doors are full size for fifteen mil figure, what have you. The actual buildings themselves, and therefore like the brickwork, is slightly smaller. They've um, it, you know, uh, so otherwise you know, like Paplot and La Haye Saint would be huge. And what they've done is that that they've just kind of shrunk the buildings a little bit, just to kind of say, yeah, yeah, that's that farm complex, and this is that farm complex, and what have you. Uh, but I just needed, I just Uh-oh. needed, a, but I just needed a couple of barns. You know, you know my sad addiction to French farms. Yeah, in fifteen mil. Yeah, they do Papalot, La Haye Sainte, and Hougoumont in yeah. fifteen mil. And the, and then and then they also do yeah. Well, well, they do those three, and then they also do they do another one that they do another little uh, a little small one as well. Uh, yeah. I, th- I think it's not a lot of one. There's, no, there's no, another little one. Uh, I just bought uh, uh, the the little timber building for because basically all I did was I I bought four buildings that have removable roofs because not all their buildings have removable roofs. Some of them are solid, yeah, cool. uh, but I wanted the ones with removable roofs. But they are re- they are no, no, they're fabulous. They are really nice. They do. Look- Oh, very nice indeed, don't they? Yeah, that, yeah, very reasonable prices, and and uh, I'm I'm not going to help your wallet here, Mike, but uh, they have a, a, an offer on the site. So if you buy bits of the Waterloo range, I yeah, if you start buying buildings from the Waterloo range, they start it, like if you buy multiples multiple farms, you start getting discount. So if you buy Paplot, you get it's it's farm price, but if you buy Paplot and La Haye Saint, you start getting discount. Four. Fortunately, I already have La Haye Saint in fifteen mil from foreground. <laughs> yeah, but it's but, yeah, but it's nice in resin. Yeah, well, I don't have, <laughs> so, have you looked at hovels? Yes, I then I've, closed I've, the I've, page. I've got the hovels uh, La Haye Saint. Um, I also am I'm holding off on that because. Um, it's a small matter of that bunch of Germans I foolishly introduced Neil to. Oh, oh, the natural bit stuff, yeah. Yeah, they do a Roman villa. Oh, yeah, mm. that's very nice. That's very nice. And, and I'm very, 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 yeah. very, very tempted. Yes, yes, that is that is that is good. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, that is very nice. Okay, so, so I just I just want to confirm my name is Neil Shuck. Okay, you are talking to me, but though those four buildings. Arrived on Thursday and they were painted by Sunday night. <laughs> Boys on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened there, but <laughs> who are you and what have you done with you? <laughs> it's quite scary, isn't it? It really is quite scary. And on top of that, the um, I, I have bought a couple of other things as well. Well, no, correction. Uh, one was bought, one arrived. I bought the the new expansion for Commands and Colors Napoleonics, which is the uh, Generals, Marshals, and Tacticians, uh, basically because that has uh, the new Tactics deck in it, which is a similar sort of thing to what you play with Great War. And I, I know what arrived because mine did as well. Yes, and uh, yes, and, and, and talking and talking of Great War, Great War, <laughs> as yes. we were, as we were, uh, yes, um, Great War arrived. Off. A load of very, very nice painted World War One tanks in fifteen mil. Yes, were yours packed properly? Yes. Ah, mine weren't. <laughs> However, must have seen you coming. Uh, yeah. However, uh, and and the because uh, fun, funny enough, on the day that the email came saying uh, we think we've got a bit of a problem uh, with the packing, uh, my my parcel arrived on the same day that Will sent that update out. Uh, basically, if you're not aware, it, um, the first lot of expansions they set, sent out for, for Great War Tank, um, they didn't put extra packing in. Uh, as a result, uh, the the tanks in the expansion bit had a, bit, a little bit too much room to move around in, and the guns are not necessarily that robust. So, four of my tanks and one of my whippets. Uh, had broken guns. Well, mine, are, mine are absolutely fine. And so I guess you, yeah. you, you, I must have got lucky. Having uh, well, well, what happened? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I think they realised very quickly that there was a problem, and then they so basically they stopped. Uh, they stopped that, what they were doing. 
and then repacked everything yeah, and put extra padding in and then uh, and then re- started the shipping having said that having then notified of them of and taken photos to say these these are the tanks that are the problem um i received replacements within 48 hours uh so you know i mean yeah. can't fault that can't but, fault that at all that that um i, I know i've i've gone on about this on other fora but that really isn't rocket science customer support it shouldn't be rocket science customer support and the fact that it surprises people still is a bit sad hmm yeah uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I hear where you come. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. As somebody, uh, as somebody who works in that side of the industry, from an IT point of view, I, yes, I fully understand where you're coming from. Uh, but as you say, the fact that it still comes as a surprise to people says something. Have anyway, really good. It's really interesting. All the stretch goals look good. I do like their new artillery template. That looks really cool. And, and, and yeah, so, so that was me. Um, so yeah, I, actually this month painted quite a bit, uh, bought a, quite a bit and played a game. Can't be bad. Mr. Hobbs. Hey. Oh, oh, right. What have I been doing? Well, first thing I've done, I, I've resurrected my blog. Well, hey. Tis back. Andy, Andy, yeah, I saw that. Andy's managed to put, put put at least one entry in every single day so far. I'm most impressed. Yeah. How long is that going to last yeah, for, Mike? Oh, another couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so you get fed up with it, yeah? Right? <laughs> yeah. I sort of had a list of things I wanted to post about, and I've done I've done those, so I'm yeah, a bit a bit bone now. But it's, it's it's difficult thinking what I want to put on Twitter and what I want to put on the blog. So I'm trying mm. to be I'm trying to separate them. Uh, but yeah, the, the the blog is back, baby. And, Third time and, and it's got some, and it's got some very nice. I, I mean, your uh, your articles on putting together your sharp practice forces are really interesting. Yeah, that that's mainly what I wanted for is to document that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's all done. So the blog the blog's back, right? Uh, buying things. Um, I didn't go to Hammerhead. I haven't really bought much this this month. I've been good. Uh, I did get Spearpoint 1943 though from uh, from Byron Byron Collins. Oh right, yeah, which has arrived and is very nice. Uh, um, and I played a game of it as well. Yeah, and um, I, I never played a card game before. I did, and it's lovely. It's a really nice little fun game. So um, I, I might get his his village expansion because that looks quite interesting as well. Add another another depth to the game. So yes, yeah, what that. Unsurprisingly enough, I bought a shed load of US troops for the War of 1812 stuff. <laughs> um, yes. When I started looking at um, what I've got, um, I've got enough bits to start off with, you know, bits of Canadians, and I painted them all up. But then I, 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 I sort of looked at the American troops, and I had 12. Um, <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> 12 major infantry uh, and six, um, six riflemen. I thought, I might need a few more than that. That's actually not enough to do a game. Um, so I bought some off Caliber, some of the Knuckle Duster ones, and I got some of the uh, Brigade Games ones from over in the States, the Hickey Scubs. So I've got l- loads of those. And I've also bought a Mule Train and a Hetzer from Warlord. Because the Mule Train is one of the support options, and I thought that would be quite nice to paint up. Yeah. And they were doing a special off. For in, I think it was in March, uh, a headset, a uh, resin headset for, for 10 quid. Right, oh, okay. And I thought, oh, well, we're having that. Oh, <laughs> you know? oh, 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 so, so I was going to say that, yes, that well learned support option in the War of 1812. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Headsets are useful in, in any sort of uh, World War II game. So, uh, yeah. So that, that's all I bought. It'd be really good. Painting and modeling and stuff, funnily enough, um, War of 1812 has been predominantly all I've done this month. Yeah. Uh, um, British and Canadian infantry are done. The US stuff, um, I did send 50 of the figures I bought over to my painter chap, who, who got them turned around for me in record time, because I need them next week when we go up to, up to, um, Lord Island. Up to St. Albans. Yeah. Mm. So he did, he's done 50 of the, uh, the, oh, the sort of mid-war Americans. Gareth did the 50 mid-war US for me. Um, I painted up 40 odd myself. 
of the American inf- uh, infantry. So did that almost kill you? No, the Amer- well, Americans are easy. It's blue top, some random colour for the trousers, and black well, um, webbin. Easy, easy peasy. I made some deployment points as well for shop practice too. Oh, okay. So I got some um, some uh, sixty mil round bases, and I found some old Renedra barrels and boxes and bits and bobs from various um, infantry sprues and stuck them all together and sprayed them brown and then picked up some colours on them and, and <laughs> they I'm look not, fine. I've not, I've, I've not, I've not seen those anywhere yet. Have you? Uh, have you even tweeted them? Yeah, I tweeted. Did you? Them. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I must, I, I must have missed them. I, I shall have, I, I shall have to dive back and have a look. It, it, it might be a blog post soon. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of things to do. As you um, do, yes. yeah. So I made those up. Other painting, I painted up some U.S. artillery and a gun, and I decided to do some cavalry. <laughs> and so I decided to do some New York militia cavalry because um, the New New York militia is really interesting. It's, it's, they almost had like a, a brigade. So they they had seven small regiments of cavalry. Plus a lot of infantry and artillery. So I've done one of the, uh, one of the cavalry regiments. Oh, cool. Well, call it a regiment. There's about 60, 60 people in this regiment. But they're, um, they're really fancy uniforms. It's all lots and lots of gold braiding and fancy colors. Cause the, the militia cavalry was all of the rich landowners' sons who got together for a scrap. Oh, right. <laughs> so they, they so, so they all bought their own uniforms. So the rest of the militia were in pretty scabby uniforms, but the cavalry it, it literally was a bunch of Hayward, uh, of Hoover Henrys, you know. <laughs> and they bought the, bought the best, you know, best rifles, best uniforms. This is nice. Got a nice bit of red, you know, bit of gold on there. So I'll be painting those. So that's my painting. Cool. Um, playing. Ga- I've I've been playing games as well. Um. A couple of games of Sword and Spear Fantasy, playtesting that. A couple of games of Free Jumper, playtesting that. Um, Planet Fall, had a game of that against the Ralph Oza and got my ass handed to me <laughs> completely. Get a, had a game of Sharp Practice using my Slaughter Loo figures. Ooh. <laughs> Did that cause any comment? <laughs> there was a few comments to the club, but the, the people who we were playing it. We had a great time. <laughs> oh, there were some comments. People uh, walked over and tutted. <laughs> I bet you it was one of those things. Of, yes, because obviously from from a certain distance, it's like, oh, they're playing. Um, they're playing Napoleonics. Ah, yep. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people walking over. Going, oh, what? Oh, Napoleonics. This looks great. Yes, I am. <laughs> Serves them right for being anal, anally retentive. Says the man who's painted his slaughter loo figures in the correct facings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had a game of Spear Point 43, which I, which I mentioned. So that's me. All done. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Crocky. We, we all have been busy beavers this month, haven't we? Yeah. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. Fantastic. Well, okay. Uh, well, I suppose at this point, what we'll do, uh, we'll take a break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be chatting... Oh, we got well. We got lots of hobby news to catch up on. We'll be back shortly. Announcements, new releases, Kickstarters. What's caught our eye? It's time to catch up with the Meeples and Miniatures hobby news. Okay, it's time to uh, chat about some news items that have caught our eye uh, well, over the last uh, f- three or four weeks, actually. And at this point in the show, we're joined by another host. We have Dave Luff on the line. Hello, Dave. Hello, straight back from one-to-one painting. <laughs> <laughs> one-to-one painting? Oh, yeah. Oh. This is why it's taken him five months to paint a glider. Sorry, six months to paint a glider. Yeah. Do, you, do, you do, do you do things like ink shading and, and highlighting? Uh, you know, funnily enough, actually, uh, last month, last week, I was doing uh, deck effects, 
and we was I was using that stuff dry brushing and uh, ink shading and wiping off. <laughs> so it, it's actually coming useful. Awesome. <laughs> Brilliant. What? Yeah. What like COVID and stuff? No, no. Uh, there's a there's a uh, a wall covering out there that's called Lincruster. Um, oh, it's been yeah. going since about 1837. Well, that was the date actually, and uh, it was on the Titanic. And it's a heavily embossed, it's, it's, I say a wall covering, it's not a paper. And it's made from uh, linseed putty. And it goes through a roller. And then you can just put any any sort of um, embossment on it you want. And then as it dries, it goes it goes so hard. And you can um, just put paint effects on it, dry brushing and inks and things and so on and so forth. Hmm. So how would it work for texturing scenery tiles? <laughs> you know, actually, you know. I didn't think about that till now. Actually, you know, if you if you you rolled some of that, you know, you could actually get some nice textured scenery tiles out of it. But mm. it, it'd be hellishly expensive because it's about one hundred and sixty pound a roll. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who who, who are not aware, um, Mister Luff is now uh, college student again. <laughs> yeah, you're not for much longer though. You're almost qualified, aren't you, mate? I'm almost, I'm, all, I'm almost, yeah. I'm, uh, I've got my NUS card though before I left, which is quite good. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that means yeah, that's uh, the important thing. Yeah, yeah, you, I was going to say, yeah, because you keep that for four years, don't you? Or something stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're officially a student for four years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Why not? So, Mr. Luff, painter and decorator to the stars. That's um, right. Available for uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yes, we'll put. Uh, uh, I don't know. I will have to post a business card or something on on, on the blog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's what slowed me up with the glider, really, and everything else. But let's face it; it's been quicker than it has been to get you to paint one single army, hasn't it, Neil? So, I mean, <laughs> fighting words. <laughs> You ought to see what I've been. You ought to see what I've, I've been painting recently, mate. I've you, seen. I've been. I've been following. I'm quite amazed, to be honest, Neil. I'm pretty shocked because I've never seen, known you keep a paintbrush to to lead for such a long length of time. To be honest. Well, I, and especially especially having done the glider and you took them out and did those um and, and did those jump off points, and uh, and uh, you, you threw down a challenge. So um, uh, uh, so I had to do something about that over the weekend. Yeah, what was that all about? Saying you had to do another one because it had a barrel missing, so it didn't look right. Let, let's, let, <laughs> okay, okay I'll, sh- I'll show you tomorrow night. But seriously, you, 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 I mean, I'm looking at them in front of me at this moment in time, and there's there's it was just one of the thi- uh, one of the um, I suppose this is in the wrong section, isn't it? But there we go. Uh, there's one of the uh, the jump off points I did, which is just some crates covered in camo nets but it's the only one of the four that hasn't got oil barrel hasn't got at least one oil barrel on it and it was just one of these things it, you, could, you couldn't look at them and kind of think that one it just looks the odd one out is this your OCD? yeah probably yeah, just a bit <laughs> So, so I, I just found, I just found another bit and went. Well, that's got a couple of barrels on as well as crates. I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. So, do, do you know the best go. thing about this, Mike? When I did my army up for him, my paras, right? Neil, now as long as I've known him, says to me, I don't like clutter on the battle. I don't like it. Don't like. Oh, here we don't go. want no here clutter. We want no go. clutter. Here we go. So, I'm doing my anti tank six pounders from my paras, and I think. Think of Neil, and I think, right, okay, he doesn't like clutter. I'm not going to base it make a nice little diorama. I'm just going to put all my figures separately on pennies, you know, so it's clutter-free. Neil turns up. I've done my anti-tank guns. Look, I've based them. Right. The edges and little stream at the back. and a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hedge. And I says, I says to him, so, so how are you going to keep track of casualties? Oh, I'm going to put counters on the table. <laughs> I was like, is it me? <laughs> After everything you've said to me all these years, you don't like it. I try and make him happy, and this is what he does. We've missed you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice having you back, mate. Some of us get this every week. Yeah. I just don't record it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and you know what? It gives me our time about that. Every time, every time we've been sat down painting over the last couple of weeks, he's, he's turned around and went, why haven't you bought a recorder? You know, we're chatting about stuff. And it, it, it could be gold at one point where you, know, where you have a spare few minutes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, okay, I'm listeners. Sorry, I, I hear these words you are saying in the context of the podcast. I understand the word spare and the word few with the word minutes, but 
really not going together. Not recently. <laughs> not recently. Uh-huh. <laughs> not recently. Yes, especially considering the amount of people that, as soon as they saw the podcast, <laughs> the last one that went up, especially considering we didn't put a lot in it, and they went, four hours? <laughs> four hours? <laughs> you did a four-hour podcast. And three minutes. Those last, the last three minutes were the four. killer. Yeah. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and now... On with the news, for yeah. your yeah. sake! Yes. <laughs> uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's good to have you on, mate. <laughs> Only time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, welcome, and uh, and uh, we, we look forward to your, um, to, uh, I, I think I could safely say, is uh, your unique insight on the hobby. That's one way of putting it, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's get on with it. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. Guys, what are we going to start off with then? Uh, let's start off with um, a rumour, a good old-fashioned mm. rumour. Right, so Spartan have released um, Firestorm Task Force, which is their sort of quick-play space game. Yeah. And there's rumours that that might become the base of the next version of Firestorm Armada. What, you mean next... like version 3? Version 3 of Firestorm Armada, yeah. And how long has this game been out? Um, Are they doing it again? I think they want to try and... Make it easy because uh, what a lot of people say about um, Amada is that it uses a lot of different counters, a lot of different states, and it, it, it plays for about three hours and it's quite in depth. And I think they want to try and make it a bit uh, a bit quicker, so make it more streamlined, S- similar to what they've done with uh, Planetfall. So keeping all the you know the, the same ships and stuff, but just trying to tweak the rules a bit. So uh, yeah, it'd be an interesting one. Neil did so a it's post. Not not a cold bloodied attempt to sell more figures. No, no. I mean, I'll, I'll give Spartan their due. Once they've released a figure, they always keep rules for it. So they they never trash anything. This is just really a case of trying to get the game to be quicker play. So, it, you know, it lasts for about an hour and a half instead of two to three hours. So, so um, is this potentially also on the back of trying to keep it relevant in in the face of Halo Fleet Battles? I mean, I know, I know it's, I know it's a different style of game, but Halo Fleet Battles potentially plays quicker. Um, I don't know, to be honest. With you. I mean, like you say, they're, they're different games. I mean, Halo is a much b- bigger, lot bloodier well, yeah. game. Yeah. Um, Armada has always been a very traditional game. You know, where you need about a dozen, dozen ships aside. But it, the the one thing with it is it's counter heavy. You know, you have five or six counters on each ship. You know, you've got to counter for every single thing, and I think they're trying to reduce that down so that you know what, the states the, are handled differently, and it just becomes a bit quicker, to, a quicker and easier to play. In the light of previous comments, I'm not saying a thing. Oh no, you must be hearing me. You must be hearing my thoughts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what happens with that. I have got um, the Task Force game. I just haven't had a chance to unpack it and look at it. I think that's good. I mean, anything that makes it more user-friendly for the player, and it's got to be a good thing, I think. Yeah, because, I mean, Amada's a nice game, but it, it can drag on, you know, and it is really, really traditional, so anything that speeds that up. So, yeah, and, and the way gaming's going as well with, you know, pe- people are time-limited on their leisure time, unfortunately, these days, and the people can't spend hours and hours on a game. <sighs> so if you can take away the the stuff that gets in the way of someone having a game uh, uh, that doesn't really detrimentally affect the actual spirit of the game and still get the game to move on faster, then that's all good, isn't it, really, I think, in my mind. Yeah. See, this is why we need Dave back. He comes up with this sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Moving on? Yep. So, it's another Kickstarter, but uh, oh. I, I feel I ought to bring this one up as the as the current person who seems to be playing more naval games than anybody else. Folks from Firelock Games are announcing a Kickstarter coming up shortly. No dates and times as yet, I don't <coughs> think. Called Blood and Plunder. Mm. Which is uh, clearly of matters piratical. Quite topical given the, the Black Sails series that's on Amazon Video and History that's Channel. Just, 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 just because you're catching up with it. I mean, I mean, I mean, those are, uh, those of us who are currently up to date. On our student. Uh, Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, nice. no oh, nice. I'm sorry. Three, I had two seasons. Months. I had two seasons of Vikings to catch up on first. Oh, oh I must admit, I, I haven't started watching season four of Vikings right, yet. Right, in but, which but, case, in which case, I rest my case. But yes, looks quite interesting. 
card-based mechanics, and, and I don't mean card-based just for activation. It appears to be card-based combat as well. Um, and they've got some interesting ideas for transitioning between land-based and sea-based battles without having to suddenly majorly change rule sets. Some of the models look very nice, and I suspect that you can pull in all those other nice pirate ranges that are kicking about as well. Yeah, th- th- this one does look interesting. I mean, it the f- does. The fact that you've got a, a naval game, plus you've got a small-scale skirmish game, yeah, which is the same mechanics, that's going to be really interesting. That's going to be fun. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very tempted by that. Fiercely loyal as I am to Sails of Glory, I shall still possibly dip a, dip a kickstarter toe in the water for that one. So what mm. the um, what's it aimed at then? This Is it going to be a 28 mil scale game, or is it, it looks, no scale? Or 28 it mil heroic scale, which oh, means okay. I think the ships are going to be 32? not small. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, so, I, 28 so mil basically, heroic scale, i.e. 32 mil. So basically, it's, uh, I mean, because this is something we've we saw with oh god, what's the name of that? What's the name of that set of rules that Osprey brought out recently? Oh. Private set of rules that Chris Pierce wrote that Black uh, Veil or something? No, 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 that's a TV series. Get away from that one. Uh, was it something on the high seas? Or what, what it was it? Um, there's oh god, I can't remember what it was, but it was the one that um, it was the one that North Star did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick Starter uh, for not not forgetting, of course, if you still have stuff left over from good old Legends of the High Seas. Yeah. Oh, back in the day, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got. I picked up the rule books shortly before um, those lovely blokes from um, Warhammer Historical decided that Warhammer Historical was no longer a going concern. So there's there's potential. And of course, Cutlass, great figures from um, yeah, from Black Hat. Nick, some of the figures from Freebooters, Fates. Yep. There's yep. part. I mean, it's it's almost as much the world as your oyster as something like in a Majesty's Name was for whose range of steampunk Victorian steampunk figures would I like to play with this week? Mm. Mm. It looks rather fun. I, I think yeah. I might have to check that out when it comes round. Yeah, there's there's actually a nice article about a link from their Facebook page, which does look very interesting. Yes. So yes, well worth um, keeping an eye on that one. Can't beat a bit of pirates. Yeah. Arr. One and uh, this is something uh, which we talked about uh, a few a few weeks ago, or actually Mr. Whitaker brought it up. Uh, but the reason I raise it is that we now know a li- uh, just a little bit more about it. Uh, remember, remember a, f- uh, a few shows ago, uh, Mike was talking about a new tank skirmish game that the bat- Battlefront were going to be producing. Uh, well, we now know it's coming in April, and it's and yes, it's going to be called Tanks, and. They've just uh, there's a new website for it and and there's other bits and pieces and hey guess what it's X wing with tanks. Well, it's better than having X wing with dragons. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. I suppose. There is the argument that Sales of Glory is just X wing with ships. So so don't don't go hating on the whole buy a ship and its re- re- resulting stats cards thing because it's quite a sensible way of selling miniatures. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I mean, there's yeah, there's a, there's an upside and downside to it. I mean, uh, I'm obviously tank on tank thing, and and maybe you know d- doing a tabletop version of World of Tanks, which uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a bit of an expert on World of Tanks on the show th- uh, this evening for some strange reasons. Um, <laughs> uh, but doing a doing a tabletop version of World of Tanks has got to be uh, you know has got to be uh, quite fun, and obviously Warlord had done, uh, uh, did something with their tank. Supplement for for bolt action, and uh, so, so anyway, this 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 tank skirmish game that they're producing, uh, that Battlefront are producing. Basically, what's happening is they're producing a starter set, which has uh, a Panther and two Shermans, plus some card and uh, card terrain counters and what have you. Everything is card driven. So all, well, well, all, all the stats are on cards, and it and they're producing. Uh, I think it's a about uh, a dozen expansions to begin with, uh, as far as tanks are concerned. So they're producing basically. It's it's in a similar way as what you used to get with, you know, say, X Wing Sales of Glory or what have you. You get a plastic tank, which you have to put together yourself. Uh, so it's not so it's not pre it's, so these aren't pre painted stuff. It's like it's like something you get out of their open fire set, for example. It would be a tank on the sprue, I would imagine, which you have to so you have to assemble it. And uh, assemble it yourself, and obviously paint it if you want to. 
Yeah, uh, it looks it looks to me as they're about as though they're about part way between. You remember the old FX twenty mil vinyl tanks? Yeah, and yeah. something like a plastic soldier company kit. They're about the same level of complexity, or a bit less maybe yeah. than the open fire tanks. Well, well, the open fire tanks were. I mean, you know, I mean, they were only what. Um, seven or eight parts. Seven or eight pieces, they? yeah. And they're it, they're it, quite easy to put together. I've done it, some. These look similar, um, uh, uh, but obviously yeah, the, the fact is the bottom line. You know, if you play if you play fifteen mil uh, World War Two, chances are you prob- uh, you know, chances are you've got the odd tank or three lying around. Sadly, what you don't have is the cards. Indeed, and it doesn't appear that they're selling the cards separately. You have However, to buy a tank. That, that said, that yeah. said. The starter set's only seventeen quid. Yeah, each um, each expansion is well, it's nine ninety nine dollars. I would imagine it will transfer transform in, into seven or eight pounds. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's um, a plastic tank. Uh, you get a, a stack card. You get a couple of uh, upgrade cards. Uh, a couple of hero cards. And uh, you know, what have you? In one in one sense, it's like yeah. If you ha- if you haven't done anything like this before, then it's it's a it's a brilliant in. Yeah, you know, for those of us who have lots of tanks, it would have been nice to have uh, the opportunity to. Uh, but having said that, yeah, yeah, would we play it? Are you really that's the target audience? <laughs> yeah, but that, that's it. You see, that's it. I think at I the mean, end of the day, if 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 it gets someone into the hobby who otherwise wouldn't have got into the hobby, then as far as I'm concerned, Battlefront can produce it for as long as they like. Yeah. yeah I mean, they're even doing the thing where they got uh, they got a counter set and they've got they got three battles mats. They've got a Normandy battle mat coming out. They've got uh, a Villains Bacage ba- battle mat coming out, which made me smile. Uh, so uh, initially, as, as I say, they've got about a dozen tanks coming out. They've got things like uh, uh, a Stug, Panzer IV, a- SU-122, uh, T-34, IS2, uh, Cromwell, uh, Firefly, you know, l- loads of stuff all, 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 all coming out and it's, and it's being released in April. Uh, yeah, as you say, prob- perhaps we're not, perhaps we're not its target audience. Uh, uh well, and, and, but the other thing is that they're saying that allegedly it will play in 30 minutes and the, and the rules are free to download. Sure. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's honestly, it's certainly worth a look. I, I say I was just having a look around earlier tonight, and it was just, it's just a shame that the, that the cards aren't separate. It would be nice at some point if they turn around and went, "Oh yeah, but for those people who have already got the tanks, but they're not going to do that because no, they, want they want to sell tanks." Exactly. Hey ho, that's it quickly on. But it is just to say it's pretty safe. But at some point, some point, some enterprising third party will reverse engineer the stat cards for any vehicles that aren't already in the game, because that's what enterprising third parties do. Yeah, there'll be a fan site where you can get the card stats for a Brumbar, for example. There'll be a little fan site where you can build your own army with all the points and little pins and all the cards. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, as we were talking about tanks, here's some proper ones. <laughs> what a proper scale! <laughs> proper scale. <laughs> right, Blitzkrieg miniatures, who I've never heard of before. I don't know if anybody else here has heard of them. Hang on, aren't, aren't they the guys who did stuff with the Perrys? <laughs> Some of the uh, um, aren't the people uh, people that some of the tanks they do the Perry sell on their side. Oh, there might be. Yeah, that, uh, are they the same guys? Might be. Yeah, that's that, that. That does ring some bells. But anyway, they've just started releasing um, some really nice Italian, some Shermans, and some Polish tanks. They've also got some planes. These are in one fifty six, one forty eight. They seem a bit confused about scale, though. I mean, I know Dave will consider they're very confused about scale, since they don't appear to include 15 mil. (laughs) Yeah, you've got two types of 28 mil. They've got got two types of 28 mil. They've got 148 and 156, which seems to me just a bit why. Well, there are a lot of 28 mil players who use 148 scale tanks. Yeah. I mean, Merv does, because they... They're bigger and they look proper size. Uh, yeah, true, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because yeah, the whole the whole point was one forty eight, uh, especially when you get a a heroic twenty eight mil figure on a you on mean thirty two mil um, yeah. on a figure base and put it next to a one fifty six tank. The, the tank looks too small. Mm. Yeah, that's so which comment, is, I suppose which is why 
I mean, yeah, I, I mean, t- to be honest, it wasn't, un- it really wasn't until someone like, I don't know, Warlord started, pro- started mass producing, all, uh, mass producing lots and lots of stuff in 156 that 156 really took off before then. Uh, you, you know, back in back in the day when back I back in the day, ah, uh, uh, when I, uh, 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 yeah, when I was buying back when I was buying battle on the stuff off A Deacon, uh, you know, and paying his mortgage for him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> back in the day, the only way you could get hold of vehicles was to buy the the one forty eighth f- frog and fuming kits and that sort of thing because because that was the only stuff that was around and the only other scale the only, only the scale around at the time. With some stuff that Westman were doing for Berlin or Bust, and that was one sixtieth scale. We're just spoilt for choice nowadays, aren't we? Yeah. Spoilt for choice, indeed. But these look really nice. The the Italian stuff is lovely. What scale are you looking at there? I, I'm looking at um, one fifty six. Well, they got some well, French tanks, mm. Polish really, tanks. There's some really obscure ones in there. So when next time Rich builds a chain of command scenario with some really obscure French tanks in, you might have another source of them. <laughs> well, it's always nice to pop back, isn't it, and see what's there. And it and is actually nice the fact that you've got somebody there who is doing actually the stuff that other people don't do mm. for the change, as opposed to, oh, yeah, here's another company that's producing a Panzer IV and the Sherman. Yeah, and the, the, like the, the, the classic how many different boxes of 28 well, British Napoleonic line infantry can one buy? <clears throat> Quite a few. Quite a few Quite if a few. you're doing Waterloo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, what, Warlord, <laughs> Victrix, Perry's? Um, yeah, but you only need one box for shop practice, as we learned. Yeah, but the point being, you don't need three manufacturers doing it. No, but they all want to sell their own. Hey, anyway, next one. Talking of plastic kits and, uh, and and stuff. Now, a couple of years ago, so was it only a couple? Of, only a couple of years ago, I think it was only a couple of years ago. Uh, at Salute, I I ran into a guy who was starting to sell a new range of plastics, uh, Republican Romans, and that Ajima was miniatures. Ajima miniatures, and. Over the space of a couple of years, he's he's been steadily expanding the range, um, and it looks like they've um, well, uh, they've certainly now been fully distributed by North Star. Whether or not that they've actually officially been bought by them, uh, um, I, I don't know. But uh, but certainly, North Star are now officially distributing both Ajima miniatures and also Copplestone. Yeah, so cops, so they've taken over the production and distribution. Yeah, I think reading between the lines, they've done a mongoose or war games factory with Warlord in the, I think, from what I understand, they're still, the, the original companies are still handling the, what we'd like to produce next and designing it, but North Star are dealing with the, um, the actual production. Yeah, and selling, which in in some ways, I suppose, especially from someone like Mark Copplestone's point of view, means that he can get on doing what he does best, which is sculpting miniatures, and can leave all the things like sending stuff out to do, yeah, sending stuff out to customers to somebody see, who does see, that. Sort of see thing. also war, see also mongoose and war games factory. <laughs> yes, indeed, and uh, it looks like uh, all the Copplestone stuff is going to be. Uh, it's going to be uh, back in stock. I do like I do like cobblestone castings. I really yeah. do. On, on on the subject of changes of, of ownership, those nice folks from Timeline Miniatures who produce some very nice MDF buildings in twenty eight that that are quite often things you can't get from other people. Um, they do a very nice Romano British Saxon church and a Saxon hall, which is a little bit smaller than the Gripping Beast one, and a bunch of very British Civil War type stuff, etc., have been bought by Hokahe Wargaming, Alan Rudd. They, apparently they felt the business has more potential with Alan, as he has his own figure range and scenery range too. So it looks as though that, from looking at their website, that's not actually causing much in the way of a change of uh, product range or anything. It just hopefully may mean that they get to more shows and can shift more stuff. That's always good. Mm. I'm all for that. Yeah. Well, so, uh, as you were talking about Grip and Beast, they got some new plastic uh, Romans coming out. Get me behind me, oh, Satan. Cool. Oh, oh, God, those are gorgeous. Oh, they do look nice. <laughs> and they do mix in with their Saxons. Hello. Oh, they do look nice. Mm. Uh, we, are, we are talking about the late war, Ro- late Roman stroke Romano British. 
and they yeah. are lovely. The the three ups are on their um Facebook page, and they are just stunning, stunning, stunning. Mm. Useful for um, Doug's bit, wouldn't they, Mike? Uh, well, I reckon that if it's a standard size box, uh, it'll do you a Ducks Rip, Rip Romano British broad, broad Warband, barring the hero figures. Nice. No good, well. We stopped playing Dark Age, haven't we, Dave? Dark Age? What's that? Yeah, that you remember mean? Saga? Remember, remember we used to play that? Can't remember. What's that? <laughs> Can't remember that game. We haven't played for about two years, have we? Uh, and, the, and the rest, mate. And the rest. It's been near as four. It's not, it's not that we don't it's like it. No. It's just someone's been making me build scenery and make, make roads. <laughs> and there weren't no roads in Saga era. Yeah. Yeah, I'd build gliders. <laughs> two months. Two months of dry brushing roads. You want to use a bigger bush, mate? Oh, crikey. I tell you what. How much road do you need? There's, there's also that nice textured stuff you put on walls with a roller that might be good for roads. Yeah. Yeah. Distracted for a minute. Yeah, they do look really nice. I mean, I've got a copy. I had a copy. A copy. I had a box of the, um, what did I have? Plastic Vikings, didn't I, when they first came out? You did. And, and they, they were nice as well. So it's hardly any surprise, really, that these are going to be, well, they're, you know. Like, who's sculpting them, Hobbsy? Oh, God. Um, oh, put, them on the spot, put, put, put them on the spot, why don't you? <laughs> That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked me that. Um, I can't, I don't know. I think it's Steve. I was going to say Steve Salo, it's not him. Uh, his name's gone. Sorry. Some bloke who's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, so one assumes this is we're making a, a leap. One assumes that they will that they may potentially be available from Salute. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 putting a, a, a wild leap in the dark, you know. It's always a good time to get things out there, isn't it? Indeed. Mm. Talking of which, talking of which, when we were, when we were at Hammerhead uh, the other week... Uh, Bob Naismith. Bob Naismith. <laughs> Shut oh, up, oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> and there's, on their Facebook page, in fact, there is now a sprue shot. Oh, my goodness. Oh, dear. I foresee a very expensive accident in my near future. Well, actually, it's a plastic accident, so it won't be that expensive. No, they're about, what, about uh, 20 quid for a box? Somewhere. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, God, those are nice. Oh, those are very, 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 very of course, nice. And, of course, uh, is it is it currently do, uh, do some really nice cavalry? And some really nice hero figures, as do Saxon miniatures. Of a whole yeah. range of Arthurian. Um, Mind you, having said that, so did Westwind because they're just lovely, lovely. Yeah, Westwind did a whole uh, did a lovely range, which I think I've mentioned before recently that I've got um, that I I do have a couple of um, armies for Duck Spirit from Westwind, which I bought a while ago and are in a box somewhere upstairs. So you can dig those out and paint them, make yourself a Romano British army to go with the Saxon army, and then when the Duck Spirit and the Arum campaign compendium comes out, you'll have everything you need. Sorted. Sorted. There we go. Ah, and there's a pack shot on the website as well. 44 figures in the box. Good. That's just not fair. There you go. Dave, new army for you, mate. I've got to paint the Irish army up, yeah. I still haven't done them. I don't know. Dave, you and your lead pile. You want to join your uh, I am. This year, this year, I, I, I am. I'm, I said to Neil, this is it. I'm going to get all the stuff I've collected in the last year get it done. It's oh. just this course has got in the way. Hang on, sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is all the stuff you've collected, Dave. How big is your lead pile? Oh, I don't know. You could you could probably hold it in your hand, but then some of it is six mil. <laughs> <laughs> we should also say, out at salute. Yeah, oh, shocking indeed, horror. So, and, and, and before I was so rudely interrupted by Mike drooling over Facebook again, don't you just love how we do this while you know while having the internet open? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, next next thing is uh, war bases. Uh, as I said, um, war we hammerhead. Uh, I was having a chat with Marty. Um, hello, Marty, if you're listening. Uh, at war bases, and there's a couple of things that are coming at salute. First off, they have their MDF A7V, which I uh, tweeted a photo of after the sh- uh, after the show. Uh, so they uh, they've had a uh, British uh, standard. I, th- I, th- I think it's a male 
tank out for a while in MDF, but the, but they now have uh, the A7V, which are going, which they've been previewing for a while, but that is going to be released at Salute. That's 28 mil and in NDF. And other than the fact that the gun barrels are square, uh, so that looks, so that that bit of it looks a bit weird. Other than that, it's you know, it's 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 a very nice kit. Yeah, um, that's nothing. A little bit of sandpaper won't kill. Well, quite. It's a nice, it's a nice budget World War One tank for you. Uh, so looks lovely. And by then, he may, be, it, yeah, they may be even have some new turrets for his Rolls Royce armored car. You never know. Because uh, apparently, the problem is with, with his. Several people have been trying to get hold of his, the, the Rolls Royce that he does, which is really nice. Except for the fact it has a resin turret, and they've been having some problems casting it. Ah, oh, that's why I haven't got one yet, as I want one for the home guard. Yes, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's been the issue with that. There, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, the, the, they have a problem ca- casting their turrets. Uh, right, so, two of the things. One of the thing is that they've got, they've now got the red guard available for the on guard set. That you know, they, they brought, brought out a set of figures for uh, inspired by uh, the latest uh, Musketeer series. Um, they bought a set of figures for, uh, actually to come inside with Osprey releasing on guard. Uh, all the red guard figures for that are now out, and they're going to be bringing out some more musketeers. And I believe that's coming out for salute. But also, he showed me some extra wagons and stuff that that they are producing now. You may remember in the last show, the Lordmeister himself was talking about the fact that uh, Martin had put together three wagons for shot practice too. You know, the was it the engineers' wagon, the the water, the water one, and the ammunition wagon. I think it was, was it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, as well as that, he's now producing an, uh, some more uh, wagons and, vi- and, uh, and other vehicles or vehicles to go alongside that, which includes artillery, Cassians. Is he? He's got a really nice little. Um, it's a, it's a portable. F- it's a horse-drawn forge, mm. uh, which is quite nice. Apparently, he's, he's going to be um, trying to get a, a blacksmith to go a, a blacksmith figure to a sculpted up to go alongside that and various other bits and pieces. But he's got he's got loads of stuff which is going all going to be releasing at salute. Uh, he showed me some of the uh, um, some of the prototypes that he he got done for that at salute, uh, and they look really nice. Doing the artillery is great because you. What I've been finding is it's quite easy to find um, crew. But to get the guns, you've got to go and buy a plastic set, or you've got to go and buy a metal one, which costs about 10, 15 quid. And I just think, you know, having something like War Base, we're just going to produce a gun that you can buy for a couple of quid. It's going to be fantastic. Now, I, don't, I actually, I'm not sure. I, I think they might actually be casting the barrels in, in metal. Barrel, yeah. uh, but obviously, the rest of it is MDF, mm. which is great because it was wooden. Yeah. <laughs> So it won't actually look out of place at all. You've got to paint them. Well, yeah, but but even but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean, though, because mm. painted MDF looks like painted MDF. You know, unless you actually physically stick texture on it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it looks like painted wood, but which is yeah, you know, which which if it's a brick building, can potentially be an issue. But if it's a artillery limber, yeah, or wagon, it's perfectly fine. So yeah, they're really nice. Uh, I'm not. Um, uh, um, has he po- has he posted whether uh, uh, what the price points are for them? No, I didn't see those. I just saw a picture of them on one of the news sites. Mm. But they are nice. They are mm. very nice. You know, you mentioned um, the 1672 stuff. Have you seen the range the North Star have produced for that set of rules? They got a whole range of um, armies from the French, uh, French King Louis the Fourteenth. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I saw them a while ago at um, um, Anstey uh, sell them. Saw them on, on the Anstey stand. I think they're 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 very nice. Something could be done with those. Mm. Mm. Oh, talking of talking of nice figures, uh, nice figures. Uh, you, you, yeah, you saw on stand. Now this is some, uh, there was a figure set that uh, was was launched on on Kickstarter uh, a while ago. Uh, but it's now out, they're now out they're, they're kind of they're now out in the wild if you like post Kickstarter Studio Miniatures they produced a set uh, it was actually originally linked in with the uh, the zombies game for the the, the uh, Colin Phillips was doing for uh, you know the, that's the guy who guys who wrote Scream and Sanguine and but this is called Medieval Mayhem now it, the, now the thought was it was a um, it, it was uh, Potentially a zombie outbreak in a medieval theme park. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bear with us because that's just an excuse. Me. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> there is a now a full set of character figures plus monsters um, inspired by Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And they are absolutely fantastic. Oh yes, we looked at those. I remember now. Yeah, we saw that. We saw them at Hammerhead. I mean, I, I, I must admit, the one thing I, th- I thought was um, was possibly a little over the top was the fact that you could buy a resin uh, 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 a resin rabbit, uh, as in you know, the Trojan rabbit, uh, but it was going to cost you twenty quid. I thought, yeah, you could probably not want to. You could probably. Knock one of those up out of MDF and coffee stirrers, uh, and it will and it will probably look just just as authentic. So shush, probably... shush! You're giving all our secrets so I ain't ill about telling people about MDF and coffee stirrers. <laughs> people are going to be building everything. <laughs> yeah, but Neil, look at this way: if you get the resin one, when you catapult it over the the castle walls, it won't break. You'll just it won't break. <laughs> It'll probably kill somebody on the way down. <laughs> well, obviously, you don't want to fire from a shotgun. You know, you yeah. just want to give a little. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so with that and the and and the recently posted, uh, inspired by Time Bandits war band, uh, little I mean, I mean oh, just so, just so, so many good stuff. So, mm. They're really really good. But no, the so the medieval mayhem range from Studio Miniatures. Check them out. They are absolutely brilliant. On the subject of the medieval mayhem range from Studio Miniatures, have you noticed they've got a Kickstarter going? And then who? Oh, the yeah. Hollywood Havoc. Kickstarter for the Hollywood Land theme park zombie apocalypse apocalypse game. <laughs> what? 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 Hang on. What? Well, hang on. Uh, 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 you oh. know that list of news items we're working from? Scroll to the bottom. I oh a twenty eight mil zombie game. <laughs> That's why you ignored it, isn't it? Yeah, but it's Charlie Chaplin with a Tommy gun. It is. <laughs> it unquestionably <laughs> is. And what looks like Marilyn Monroe with a chainsaw. <laughs> What? Oh, I'm so into this. Oh, I'm so into that. I'm so for that. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And Julie Garland with an axe. <laughs> There's a whole new meaning to the phrase, Mommy Dearest. <laughs> We're off to see the wizard. <laughs> what? And, and Boise in trouble. With the wizard. <laughs> Elvis with an Uzi. Fantastic. <clears throat> yeah, but that, so that's just Boba, that's just Boba Hotep, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, oh, oh! I like the monsters. Yeah, yeah the, monsters the monsters are quite are... awesome. The Wolfman yeah. is brilliant. Yeah, that, that, that is Lon Chaney, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and Frankenstein is, uh, Frankenstein is definitely Bela Lugosi, isn't he? Yeah. Guys, question for you: Has that not made you feel an awful lot happier about zombie-themed Kickstarters? <laughs> yes. So is that is it true then that so then not only is everything better with zombies, but also Kickstarters are better with zombies? Certainly looks that way. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and it is, and and it is actually an official expansion for the zombies game from the Scrimmage Sun game guys. Because it's uh, yeah, there's a uh, uh, it, it's, actually, it's a rule supplement written by Colin Phillips and Chris yeah, Peach. You can yeah. actually get uh, you can actually Skirmish get a printed rules. version of the uh, of the medieval mayhem rules if you want. Oh, brilliant. oh yeah, I like that. Uh, what else we got? Oh, Great Escape Games. They um they turned up the other day with a new a new game coming out. I think I think it's out of salute. Yes, uh, it will be. Yeah, the the Chicago way. So uh, I I don't know if this is based on the same rules engine as um, Dead Man's Hand, but uh yeah, it's a 1920s mobster game with agents, police, gangsters, and moonshi- moonshiners. Ooh, and they're doing a deal, I think, with Foreground to produce the train. Ooh. Yes, in the same way that in the same way that Foreground produced the get, produced the train for Dead Man's Hand. Mm. Yeah, now now last time we had last time we had uh, Stuart on the show, he he was kind of teasing this, wasn't he? Saying that was what that's the next thing they were working on. Uh, so I suppose well, well, I mean. We haven't got time to get him on before salute now, but I suppose we we'll just have to get him back on. I mean, I mean I know that you'll just have to never get him into a corner at salute and shove a microphone up his nose. Well, if, if it's anything like Dead Man's Hand, he'll probably appropriate me and throw me uh, yeah, yeah, and throw me in front of a table and say, "Let me show you the game." So there we go. 
But uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. That's looking. Uh, that's looking good. It's it's, it's nice to have. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to have uh, uh, another gangster game because. Well, we haven't had one for a while. Was it the Cobblestone one? Was the last one they did? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that was actually a game. It was just a... No, it was, it was just a range of figures, wasn't Which it? Which are then? very nice. Mm. I, 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 who, was, who was it that... Oh, quirky. Who was it that, that that then did the whole thing where they painted that whole range in black and white? Oh, that was done at, um, at a show, wasn't it? Yeah. But, but that, that, was, that was just inspired. That looked really cool. Anyway. Anyway, anyway yeah. Um, yeah. I... I have actually seen some of the masters for this, and um, they're very nice. The the gangsters are lovely. Mm, good stuff. Uh, yeah, so uh, we shall find out um, as much as we can next time. Well, uh, hopefully, when I bump into Stuart Salute, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grab an interview with him, uh, interview with him, and then uh, you know we we might get a chance to get him on the show and have a chat. I'm Might'll sure. Good. I'm sure we can get him back. Indeed. Something tells me it won't be terribly hard. And I think the only other one, uh, which feeds quite nicely into our next segment, is um, Bad Squiddle Games. Oh, spoiler alert. We can't we can't break that in the news and then talk to Manny, surely? No, so maybe we should just say, if you Bad want to know... Bad Squiddle Games are releasing something. Keep listening. Yes. Yeah, listen for about five, ten minutes and you'll find out what. Indeed. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll be chatting with the Dice Bag Lady herself. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. Well, we'd like to welcome back to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. It's Annie Norman. Hello, Hello Annie. Hello. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, pretty well. Thank you. Good stuff. Well, it, it doesn't seem that long ago since we were... I mean, I suppose it, I suppose it was last year. But uh, it doesn't seem that long ago since we were last chatting. It's, it's, it's great to have you back on. Yay. Well, I had a nice time last time. <laughs> well, um, I, was, I was always going to say, it's, it's the dice bag lady, but... Sadly, no more, I understand. Not so much. I'm kind of... It's a bit strange. Not so much dropping it or anything, but I have sold all of the bags that I did have, and my hands don't seem to be getting better. So I'm just kind of focusing on the miniatures now. So I've yeah. still got a little bit of hope, but I think a lot of time, like it shows people, I'll ask about the bags a lot, and I'm trying to just sort of push it away a bit now, because nothing's changing. So I'd rather focus on the positive, which is the the figures and the way that they're going. Yeah, as I say, I, I, I did kind of sp- spot that tweet back in the last week, and it was kind of, oh, that's quite sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I think it's took about a year for me to come to terms with it, because they've, they've been terrible all year. But I keep thinking, oh, maybe next month I can get back on it, and maybe next month for now I've had to sort of draw a bit of a line and mm. slowly take the Dice Bag Lady away from things, but switch it into Bad Squiddo. So it's thing, yeah. just things like show listings, but it's always going to be there in some form. Um, so I've, start, I've started a small thing as well where I've produced the iron cross bags. I don't know if you've seen those. They're, um, so I've more done the design element rather than the physical making of them. So they're foil, oh. foil printed iron cross bags. So I'm interested to try that out with a few different companies as well and see if that goes anywhere. Oh, cool. So just sort of changing it a bit. But try, yeah. trying to build up Bad Squiddo Games and the figures that I manufacture as well, because there's still a lot of people that just think I'm a, a retailer. And and I, I still get people from shows that will see me at loads of shows and say, oh, you should make your own miniatures. Like, I have, I am. <laughs> so, <I've> also, <laughs> Please don't make your eyes over <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of these ones. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. So yeah, just trying to focus on that a lot more now. But it's it's... I think we said in the last uh, podcast that it's it's kind of sad, but it's also not. It's it's just moving on. Yeah, as I say, it's it's great to have you back on. And uh, I mean, well, since we last chatted, uh, it seems you've been rather busy. Mm. So we thought, uh, yeah, we thought we'd catch up and find out exactly what's been going on with Bad Squiddo uh, since we last chatted. When did we last chat? It's an excellent question, well presented. 
I, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Hobbs has this information immediately to hand. Well, for me and Annie, it was yesterday. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well in a recorded <laughs> element. Yeah, oh, thanks well, for that, Mike. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so actually, yeah, actually, because this is a, this is this will be episode one six eight. eight. Yeah. One six eight. So, so ten episodes ago. Right. Five months. Indeed. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So yes. <laughs> so, it is so, quite a while. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. So we last spoke. Yes. Five months and um, ten episodes ago. Uh, episode one five seven. Um, so yeah. Uh, and since then, according to the notes that uh, Mr. Hobbs has so uh, 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 so brilliantly put together, you you celebrated your first birthday of Bad Squid. Bad Squid. Yeah. Not that long ago, actually. Week or so. Oh, cool. Um, of, of, you know, being the figure and doing the figure manufacturing and believable female miniatures, which is... So, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and how's it gone? Very well. Much better than expected. Uh, it's strange sort of having two birthdays because, you know, the Dice Bag Lady's been much longer. I think it's been about six years. Yeah, it was six years this year of being the Dice Bag Lady. And then just that last year of switching into miniatures. So, on one hand, I feel established, but also brand new. <laughs> Hmm. So yeah, that's that's been an interesting year. But yeah, like when we last spoke, it was I was doing a lot of frost grave related things. And then I had hmm. this sudden, ah, I haven't done any female miniatures. My releases have been quite slow, so went a bit crazy. So the last few months I've I've released some more Shield Maidens. So I've got Brynhild Foreign, um the Shield Maiden Fighter set, um Athelfled, and a strange sort of out of nowhere Catherine the Great that went much better than expected. Hmm. Um, I've got one fantasy figure, a fantasy knight, and a couple more orcs. So just sort of filling out bits bits and bobs of my own range. I'm kind of focusing on historical, which is seems to be the way that it's going now. Um, and that's yeah. what I have the most interest in. And when I look through the, the different ranges I stock, that's where the big gaps are. So that works out well. Because I don't necessarily want to be making things that other people are making, because I, I don't feel like there's a point. Yeah. You know, if someone's doing something and they're doing it well, then why don't I do something that they're not doing? And then there's there's more more out there. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, One in a business sense, but also just so that there's more out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's no need to be competing or trying to go in on someone's thing when there's so many other things to do. Okay, so. It's taking your first birthday then. So, exactly how many new miniatures have you produced in your first year? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I could have a very quick look. What? So this is so this is isn't one of the things that's on your copious amount of notes. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> it's because they're in packs. Sometimes I don't think there's that many, but then individual figures. Twenty nine up until the Soviets. So yes, there are twenty nine figures in my range so far. Cool. Over the last year, and that's covering what the fantasy historical. Yeah, so it's mo- mostly sh- shield maidens, orcs, and a couple of bits and bobs like the Ted the Wolf and Mary the Paladin. Mm. Cool, Gustav. But now, but now, but, but yeah. now, <laughs> it's going a bit. <laughs> yeah, so I've just the simultaneously secret, the secret the secret pro- the secret project which uh, which which was announced what. Uh, hang on, ten days ago. Yeah, uh, a bit more. Fifteen days ago. Was it? Oh, International Women's Day, wasn't it? It's the one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, almost doubled the range in an instant. I think because it's a lot of it was quite slow, and it was quite a learning curve of producing miniatures. So it's there was lots of harsh lessons to be learned mm. along the way last year, or what you'd call cock ups, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So lots of sort of steps forward, steps back, and learning how to manage it all. And then suddenly I kind of come out with an extra 23 figures. But I, that's what I'm into now. I want to just keep ramping them out and keeping up with releases. Now I know what I'm doing. Mm. So you, you've found found more sculptors and you've moved into metal now, haven't you? Yeah, um, the metal was a big thing because mm. I just couldn't keep up with the demand. I think we went over this last time that the the resin just wasn't able which was which was brilliant actually because obviously when I started it I wasn't sure if anyone would even buy them <laughs> so having to you know make them at such a rate that people were buying them was brilliant but also a bit of a pain that I couldn't make them so where I can just get a big chunk of metal delivered 
just makes it so much easier to create more and get more out there. And now I've started selling through different retailers as well. So it's easy to fulfill all of those orders too. Okay, so do you want to take us back to the beginning of Secret Project R? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and tell us all about it and why you came up with what you did and, and, and uh, the whole thing behind it. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit of a surprise, really, that it was able to be kept a secret for a while because Hobbs knew, so. Oh, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I know many secrets from many people. <laughs> yeah, that's why we try and keep him alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah if, my deathbed's going to be really good. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I think we're all going to be there to make sure we get all the good secrets that you've been keeping. <laughs> <laughs> we won't just be making sure that you're dead. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Two of you holding me down and you've all <laughs> the pillow. <laughs> okay, secret project R. Mm. Is okay, that half so, a um, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels like it's been ongoing for a lot longer than, than it has because it was only really about November it, it begun. And it didn't didn't fully happen till the new year. But because of the secrecy and having to be so intense with it, it feels like it's been just a huge part of my life already, which when I looked at it, it was really not that long. Right. So it's, uh, if people aren't aware of it as they're listening, it's Roman of the Red Army, um, a new Soviet World War II range, which is all women. And it kind of came out of nowhere. So I've kind of been pottering about with Dark Age, Medieval, going that way. And then all of a sudden, I've kind of leapt forward to it more modern with a whole new sub-range. Um, I've got a big chunk of books that that I use for the female miniatures. Right. And they're quite broad, but I've got this it's kind of growing into a library, sort of A to Zs and encyclopedias. And I sort of just sit and flick through them all occasionally and look at new angles to go. I've sort of got this list going on of where I want to go next. And I just happened to be looking through and saw about the Nactex and the Night Witches. I thought, oh, these had not heard of these before. These are interesting. Started looking and started googling. Then started looking into Russia, World War II, and I kind of had a bit of awareness about it. And yeah, that that kind of surprised me just how huge the female involvement was. So then I kind of got deeper and deeper, and just got it was absolutely the next thing that I had to do. Right, bit of an odd one because you you sort of hear about about the women fighting in, in, in the Russian army, but you're never sure how much of it is sort of propaganda and how much of it was actually reality, but you've done quite a bit of research yeah. to actually what happened, haven't you? This is what made it really fascinating, because once I started reading, and then I start, you start getting deeper, and then you get a bit deeper, and it's just turned into something that fully amazed me, and it kind of gets addictive digging deeper and deeper into it. Because you read the, the start of it, you read, you go, oh, this is brilliant. And then you read a bit more and that contradicts it. And you kind of just keep finding all of this information that contradicts itself until you almost sort of cut through to what what I perceive to be the reality. Because I've only obviously seen and read third hand, you know, sources. But from, from what I've been researching, it's just been quite a bit of a journey, really. Mm-hmm. So there's there's quite a lot of books written on the subject. There's obviously the Osprey books, which everyone goes to, which are sort of almost intro books, and they've got lots of nice pictures in them. But it was interesting to read those and then to read these books. There's a few that just go so much deeper and using a lot more Russian sources and kind of getting Russian in between people for their research to help out because there's yeah. so, so much stuff there that you just can't get to because it's all in Russian. So there's a whole load of books to look through. There's um, little snippets on YouTube. There's the internet. I then discovered the Russian internet <laughs> via the translation sites, which was obviously a bit jaunty. But again, the first books you look into will mention the same names and the same, almost the same sort of snippets of information. But once you go through it, because it, it makes it look like there's only a few people, so there's sort of celebrity snipers and tankers. And it's just the same names. You think, well, these are different. These stand out. Mm-hmm. But there's just so, they're just the, the tip of the iceberg, I guess. So the more you get into it, it's just fascinating. So the the start of it would suggest that the women, you know, looking at the Russian propaganda, that 
the women there were brilliant. They were more sort of superhuman fighters. And it's that sort of, you know, obviously the same as anyone else's propaganda, we're the best and they're super heroic and charge into battle. And then you look at the bigger picture of it and it is really interesting why there are so many women that, that signed up. And I've, I've lost the statistic for that, but when the war broke out, the amount of women that straight away signed up to join the army was a crazy high number. But up until that point, they had through propaganda, been getting women interested in fighting because it's obviously sort of motherland points. And the way I started looking at it through reading it was that you get points for for certain things that you do would almost give you bonuses and points for red arminess and oh, okay. pa- like a bit like patriot points. <laughs> yes, <laughs> was my way of sort of managing it in my head. So all these different things you can do for the motherland get you this many points. But if you go and fight on the front line, that's a whole lot of points. So obviously war breaks out and they want to be there. And up until that point, they've been saying through their posters and their campaigns, yeah, yeah, this is great. We love women fighting. This is going to be really good. And then they all sign up and they go, "Mm, yeah, but you could kind of work on the factories and you can, you can do some medic work, but we don't, really it was a nice idea but we don't really want you there and that was the start of it yeah but because of the way that they'd been conditioned which was a lot different to everywhere else they kind of weren't gonna take no for an answer (laughs) so then as the war goes on and obviously the red army just take tremendous losses they start thinking "Well, we've got all these people that are really really keen to fight and they slowly let them in for all the different ways and um, they they filter in. They don't filter in to the extent. So in my presentation, I've I've said that there was one million women in the Red Army. Yeah, that's not one million women on the front line fighting. Right. But there are still a lot more because I then looked into all the other forces, and it's it is just just the Soviets that allow them on the front line and fighting. So they still have, obviously, tons more than anyone else, which, you know, have zero. Yeah. But then it just gets it just gets more complex, which makes it more interesting. Because <laughs> uh, when I was reading, I kind of think, oh, it starts off going, there's a million. I think, oh, a million's brilliant. Cool. And then as you go down and it goes, yeah, but there wasn't. I think, oh, it's a bit rubbish then. I go, well, there was. <laughs> it sort of goes back up. So, you yeah, know, there's not a million, but there's a lot. And they're in... From what I've read, they're in almost every field imaginable. Yeah, cause, I mean, because most people kind of consider female combat soldiers to be much more of a recent thing, isn't it? You know, it's, it, you know, it's much more of a kind of a recent gender equality sort of issue, isn't it? Or, or that's what a, a lot of people seem to consider it to be. I think, I think, as the Soviet Union was so detached from everywhere else, that's why it was different. Yeah. So the British and Americans were discussing it quite a lot, saying, "What well, shall we send women to the front line? And they were openly discussing it. And there were talks, and then they kind of went, yeah, we can't do it. It's, it's kind of a line too far. Yeah. So they did to some extent, you know, there were a lot of women in, com- in combat, in, in the army. So in Britain, there were the anti-aircraft Ladies, you know, in America, they had tons of, you know, spotters, radio people, the women's auxiliary corps, but none of them were fighting. None of them were pulling triggers and that the pulling trigger is the key, the key difference. Yeah. And on the other side, the Nazis are absolutely no way allowing this either. It obviously happens with, you know, the sort of rogue officer and you hear about those sort of stories, but not in the whole combat front line type type scenario yeah so the soviets are totally different but they just sort of did it (laughs) they didn't have the open discussions that america and britain were having they just sort of went yeah we'll just put them there but then it gets more complex (laughs) because obviously hitler is so against this idea and they're dehumanizing the soviets so the idea that the the soviets are using women to fight was just more more propaganda for the germans so there was a word, uh, Flinton Weiser, it was Flinton Weiser, mm-hmm. um, which translates to gun broads, and they were calling <laughs> them the Bolshevik beasts. And it was the whole, the whole thing was that how ghastly it was that, that the Soviets were using women. And in a sort of 
playground talk, this Hitler saying, oh, yes, you know, the Russians are so desperate, they're even going women with guns. And Stalin's sort of going, uh, no, no, we're totally not doing that. Hire some more women. <laughs> so a lot of it was shrouded in secrecy, which, again, makes it even harder to get the information out because they were doing it because they needed more bodies. It was just a fact. But they didn't want to look like they were desperate for bodies, which they were. So that that makes it interesting. Well, you know, things when you look at the, the Russian losses during the war, it's no wonder they had to you know, literally bring in every single able-bodied person. Yeah. What, what did the Russians lose? Is 13 million? I'm not sure, but I know it was, it was a lot. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I ended up listening to all of the Dan Carlin that you recommended, Hobbs. Mm. Yeah, goes to the Ost front. Oh, Dan because Carlin, I, brilliant. Yeah. yeah, when I started, um, I obviously started looking into the whole women Eastern Front, but it was sort of like I'd started in that pinpoint, and then I realised that my World War Two knowledge isn't amazing. It's probably worse than a ton of war gamers. And the Eastern Front in particular, I started to realise that I had almost no idea about it at all. So I had to step back and then just look at the broader picture to try and place the information I had about the women into the, the bigger picture. So just the, learning about how brutal the Eastern Front was just a whole other piece of interest. Then, yeah, it is interesting because it's because it is almost it, it's it's almost a completely different war, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the same in, in World War One. It's just the, the the vastness of it. You know, it's just. You know, there, there was massive battles going on there, which you know the, the ones we had over in the West, which are you know sort of celebrated as being great big massive battles. Yeah. They were nothing. <laughs> you know, that was... think these these <laughs> just fit into there in a tiny little point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the... and, and we hardly ever hear about we we hardly ever hear about most of it. But then there is that whole the whole Iron Curtain thing. There's just so much secrecy about it, um, and from learning about the women in in the Red Army, it's there's a couple of books. There was one in particular, um, Soviet Women on the Front Line, which has been mm-hmm. the best book. <laughs> and they really pull it apart of getting... They, every time they look at something, they kind of tell you what the Russians were t- telling their own people, what the Russians were telling the rest of the world, <laughs> what people... You know, the, um, letters from the front line are obviously heavily inspected, so they're not necessarily the best sources even though they're the first hand ones Mm -hmm. because they're kind of saying yes everything's great I love my country (laughs) when that's not the reflection and then trying to dig through all of that into and then there's the post-war accounts as well and trying to suck out out of all that the 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 truth (laughs) basically it's the classic problem of history historical research isn't it it's trying to figure out who your sources were and who they were writing for yeah (laughs) So as I said earlier, when you first look into it, you go, oh, these you know, heroines of the Soviet Union, these are amazing. And then you start reading about these accounts you know, of, of women that have, they didn't actually want, some of them didn't want to go to war, but kind of felt like they had no option or they were trying to get their family's good name back. And the same reasons that a lot of the men went to war. So it, it wasn't that they were superhuman and yes, we definitely want to go fight. So there's these accounts from the front line, you know, just saying it's awful and they want to go home or there's, there's other women that are full of the charge that saying, oh, this other woman, she's rubbish, you know, <laughs> I don't know what she's doing out here. So just, just the, the human variety of people, which is normal, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't document that so much because they obviously want to focus. It's, it is, whilst looking for it, it's all, all of the propaganda elements and all of that. It's exactly the same as with the men. So you can just, you can almost lump it into the same, the same thing. You know, there's plenty of men on the front line that want to go home or aren't equipped or aren't mentally or physically prepared to do it, or they've snuck in because they were so young. So it's it's just more complex than than being all of these superhuman, you know, three hundred kill snipers because that's obviously all you hear about in the the front of it. Hmm. Like you said, yeah, it, it's trying to separate the propaganda from the reality, which in you know, in a normal situation is, is hard enough. But when you include thirty years of the Cold War on top of that. Yeah, and um, and Russia isn't exactly the most um, open, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, area for um, giving you that information. It is it, it it sounds like you did an awful lot of research. Yeah. 
So when when you first look into it and you go, oh, you know, Russia's kind of leading the way here, whilst nobody else has got women fighting, they've got they've added a million to their army just by having women in. And, you know, maybe this means that they're they're great on equality and this is awesome. And that was my first thought. I went, oh, this is brilliant. And again, then you start looking deeper and the whole how they'd built it was just all, all propaganda, building them up into thinking that they were allowed to go fight and be totally equal. But it was, yes, you can go and fight, but you also it was if your women womanly duties is to do all the things that a man is doing, but then do all the things that a woman's supposed to do as well. So yeah, you can go and fight for your country, but you also have to keep the home, have children, do all of this on top. And that's just normal. That's not you being a superhuman, which that is being a superhuman to be able to do all of that. That's just normal. So then there's even more pressure on them. And uh, I learned about the first separate women's volunteer rifle brigade, <laughs> right. which uh, which was the thinking behind the rifle unit that I've got. So since I've posted all this up on the internet, there's been a few people commenting and uh, quite a few people have said, I didn't realize that there were rifle women. And there were, there were nowhere near as many as there would have been medics or radio operators or anything like that. So it's still a rarity because they're, yeah. again, they're not encouraged even near the end of the war. They're not massively encouraged to go there. But there's a lot of people writing letters to Stalin <laughs> demanding to go on the front line. And Stalin's kind of going, well, this, this looks good. She'll make a good front cover. Sure, go on the front line. But on mass, it's still still quite rare. But the uh, the women's volunteer rifle brigade was very interesting, and that's that's why I decided to do that little unit there. So that was formed in 1942, and before then, there'd been well, not too long before then, they'd started doing the the night, night bombers, which were right. all women or women regiments. And they'd gone down really well. They, they, were, they were efficient, they were working, and they were saying because it's all women in one place, it cuts out a lot of politics, you know, issue, gender issues, people being concerned about, oh, if we have women on the front line, they'll be fraternising all of this. So, okay, we'll put them all together. This is working great. Let's have a whole, whole women's rifle brigade. So they proposed that they were going to have 160,000, 162,000 in total, 50 divisions. They had this great plan, so they started it off. Um, they got a lot of women from the front line and also lots more that was just kind of still desperately waiting. And right, okay, women, here's your chance. You can all, you can join this women's rifle brigade. It's going to be brilliant. They're obviously really excited. They've been waiting for their chance for all of this. It was huge, so it's got rifle battalions, reconnaissance, automatic weapons, comms, mortars, machine guns, medicals, all of this, the whole lot. And it didn't really work. Right. But what happened, well, this, is, this is another one that's been so hard to get information about. And this was something to do with the NKVD Shadow Army. And again, because of the night bombers, that was a whole, until that was launched, that was secret as well. So right, okay. they're keeping all of this secret. And then obviously after the war, those secrets sort of fade away. And because it, it wasn't a success like the night bombers, they're not going to be bragging about it. So mm. you've really got to dig for this. And they're the sort of things that have taught me that the internet doesn't actually have everything. So I assume... Oh, what, so you, I assume what, what, so you have to use books. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I look at things in books and I think, oh, I wonder if I can Google it. And just nothing comes up. So you think, wow, there's, there's nothing. There's not even references to books or anything. This really is just, you know, maybe there's tons of it in Russian that I can't find. So um, they had this brigade. They trained, fully trained them. There, there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. They were all very competent. It was great. But it was as if they had a, a second thought about it. So maybe they thought, well, it's a great idea, but we still can't... You know, even though Russia are leading the way with women in combat, they still can't really put it into practice. So it's like the theory is good, but they still can't go that last way into putting them on the front line so maybe it just doesn't feel right 
So they used them and they did exist. Um, but they mostly ended up on the back lines, like sort of digging trenches, uh, guarding places, guarding factories, doing construction. Um, places like, oh, I can't pronounce it, <laughs> Smolensk. Smolensk. Smolensk, yeah, Smolensk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, places that they'd just liberated, they'd send the Women's Rifle Brigade in just to keep it safe and guard it and all those. But they didn't go on the front line. So because some of them, the whole time they're being told that they're going to go on the front line, the morale is appalling because that's the whole point. <laughs> the yeah. thing, and it's almost a demotion for some of them because they've come off the front line and they're thinking, oh, that's great because I'm going to come back. I'm obviously going to be an officer. This is going to be ace. And they end up digging trenches, which to them is not good because this is not where you get your Soviet points. <laughs> mm. So the morale's terrible. The The story ends up just going quite quite depressing. But there's, there's obviously the you know, same as all to war. There's suicides, desertions. But there's there were desertions to the front line. <laughs> oh, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were so desperate to fight. And there were a couple of cases I was reading where they'd said, oh, you know, we're girls. We're not, they're not in the army because they're classed as voluntary, even though they're kind of not. It's a bit of a loophole. So they're not... Um, they're not going to get the same disciplinary measures as if you were in the army. So they're sort of going, oh, we're girls. They're not going to give us the same disciplinary that they do to the, to the chaps. And they go, okay, fine. We'll make an example of you. We will give you the same level of disciplinary. And then they kind of go, mm, right, what we'll do is we'll send you to the front line. <laughs> like, Damn it. Yay. <laughs> so some of them do end up going to the front line as a punishment. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a bizarre thing to have happened that that's that's the way it would go so it just shows how desperate they are to get there and even in you know even in soviet russia they're still not it still takes a lot of begging to get to the front line so again they are there um they're just not there as on mass as you would first imagine but there are still plenty and it's not unusual so there's plenty of photos that i've come across of just units just general war photos and there are women just dotted about. So the rifles and the, the general squad that I've created, I thought you can either, if you want to, you could replicate the women's rifle brigade, which is a nice idea that they can finally yeah. get to the front line. So you can have all of them together. Or what I imagine will be most common for people to do is just dot them about the troops. So I've made them compatible. The figures I've made compatible with, I had... Warlord, Artisan, and Crusader. So I made sure they would, would fit with all of those. So which, and, which right. bit of the war are they? I mean, are they going to go with the likes of the Baker Company early Winter War stuff? Or are you planning I'm, on doing stuff that will? I'm hoping, well, because they're kind of mid, well, 42 onwards. Um, I'm hoping that they will be loose enough that you could use them for lots. So that the first wave I've released are sort of spring-summer uniform but then later on, hopefully not too much later on, um, I'll be doing the whole sort of great coats, Ushanka type. But for the, for the means of production, it's easier to start off with that and then build up, you know, to the heavier sort of gear. And then yes. maybe do some uh, of the padded jackets. So, so what ranges, sorry, what, what packs have you actually released or have you got on pre-order at the moment, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. So, the 23 figures are, there is a command pack, which is a medic, officer, and radio operator. The medic is firing a gun just because she can. <laughs> She's showing off that she can. Um, I've got two SMGs, um, an LMG team, six rifles, so they're all your troops. But then I've got free tank commanders and free tank riders as well. Which uh, was, again, interesting, because I could only find two tank commanders in my English research. And then as soon as I started getting onto the Russian media, there's just so many of them. It's, it's just crazy how many more. So again, we've just sort of cottoned on to some great stories, because obviously within these sort of things, there there are some great stories, and they're the ones that, that make it into everywhere. But then there's just tons of other people doing it as well. So well, that's common enough to, to have some figures of them and some tank riders. You know, I've, I've seen no photos of female tank riders, but again, it's it's not crazy 
to imagine that they wouldn't. If there's plenty of them on the front line, then they'd be sitting on tanks as well. So, also, it looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that. <laughs> and you got snipers as well. Oh yes, I do. I forgot about them. <laughs> I can't forget about you. I know. <laughs> Um, I've got two packs of uh, sniper teams, so the snipers and spotters. Mm-hmm. And I actually really, the, the spotters was something I learned about afterwards, because again, I just thought, okay, snipers, and didn't know anything about spotters. I've been learning a lot about warfare and World War Two because it's been a bit of a blank spot in my historical knowledge, that the whole warfare element of it. Yeah. So, it wasn't really till that long ago that I even knew that there were spotters. I just, which when I looked into it, it seemed quite a common misunderstanding as well of the lone sniper, but not that they're they're both snipers really. And just sort of taking it in turns. So the teams, uh, this the spotters that Alan sculpted are really characterful. I think they work really well together, and that they're obviously the iconic part of it. So I think the snipers have been the best seller so far. But so far, well, pretty much everything has been because I've organised them into bundles. So, right, pretty much nearly everyone who's ordered has ordered the bundles, and then maybe a couple of packs on top. So it's it's been going really well, which is really encouraging. Cool. So they've been uh, so I say so uh, uh, so they've been well received. Then it was worth the stress. <laughs> <laughs> so so far, it's um you know dark ages. You can get a lot, get away with a lot. <laughs> There's, you know, you can't really go that wrong. Even though I did a lot of research into that as well, just for costuming and costuming, you know, their armor and what they possibly would have worn. There's, there's no distinctive that wouldn't happen with anything yeah. I've done. <laughs> and there's obviously that preconception about as you get closer and closer to modern day with with historical gaming that the details get. More and more beardy, maybe. <laughs> so, oh, it's, oh, it's, <laughs> the case of, it's happened with a living memory, therefore. That that was also a minefield because there are tons. And again, I didn't realise there's just so many photos of Soviet women. You Google them, and there's tons. The books, the books have got even more in them. But lots of those photos are propaganda photos, or they're official photos. They're not wearing the things that they'd necessarily be wearing in combat. Hmm. So I had such a long discussion with myself about whether to put the medic in a skirt because I couldn't figure out if they'd wear a skirt because the the sh- you know the show dress the marching parade dress is obviously all nice skirts. I mean, well, would you wear a skirt? Wouldn't you just wear trousers? There's plenty of pictures of them in trousers as well, and those sort of details were the ones I just couldn't make my mind up on and sort of keep going round in circles. She's got a skirt on <laughs> in the end because <laughs> uh, cause I'm going to do the summer uniform, the winter uniform. I thought, yeah, there there are. I did find photos of them on the on the battlefield in their skirts, and it's also there's a historical element and then the figure elements. So I thought well, I've got a bit more variety in the figures as well. Then so I've got one in the skirt and the officers in an, an officer's dress too. So they're not all you know totally the same, and it's also totally historical too but those little de- there's so many little details like they're wearing a palotka they're wearing a beret this one here is but this one isn't and <laughs> i've been working for this project i've been working quite closely with the sculptor alan marsh so we've been kind of having a bit of a study session with it all which just mm. seemed to be quite intense because it just kept going on and on of we were both so i was obviously researching a ton which was really draining because it by the time i decided i thought Okay, right, definitely new World War Two. I'll have a couple of packs that I'll release at Salute, which then quite quickly turned into, let's have tons of packs and release them at Salute. <laughs> like, ah, so I need to get this information to my sculptor really, really soon. So we've got time to get that into production and then get that to someone to paint and it'll all be fine for April. And time <laughs> passes really quickly in the, in the War Games world, I think. So I was already aware that the time was running out. So I was spending a lot of time buried in books, but also trying to keep the business going as well. So doing all the 
the day-to-day -day things, which is growing. Now it's getting to a point where it is a full day just doing the orders and keeping the website updated and dealing with the emails. So trying to see how quickly I could get that done, then get back to my research. And not being able to talk to anyone about it because it was top secret. And us both sort of working away in all these details. And so the sculptor was quite involved because he ended up with a pile of books as well. <laughs> and this sort of back and forth, what about this? Uh, be back in an hour. <laughs> no, right. but I still don't know. What about this? Will they notice? Someone will notice. Ah! <laughs> So there was so much stress about that that when I launched it, I was thinking, oh, here we go, forums. <laughs> what have I done wrong? What was wrong? And surprisingly, uh, apparently I haven't done anything wrong. So that's good. I'm sure it will come. I'm sure some people will come up to me at Salute and tell me that they're, they're all wrong. <laughs> but well, that's you've done wrong is, is you've, you've done the wrong scale. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It would be interesting because there were a few people that mentioned 10 and 15 mil, but then it's hard enough at 28 mil trying to trying to make them obviously women, but without caricaturing them. So I think at 15 or 10 mil, I can't really see what the difference would be. They would be so slight that I don't know if they would be worth making. It, it, it doesn't matter what scale you go for, what period. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You've always done it wrong. <laughs> usually the thing is as soon as you release it yes we're releasing these and and we're releasing them in this scale and usually the first comment by somebody on the news item is <laughs> why why haven't you released them in this scale <laughs> which yeah. happens to be the scale that they play as opposed to the <laughs> one that you've released it in <laughs> yes why aren't even in, in in the winter uniform <laughs> some some people are at least polite enough to say are there plans to <laughs> <laughs> There was a bit when I uh, when I first put them out because I obviously got to decide what I'm going to release. So you obviously can't release it all at once unless you've got a million pounds, which I don't have. So I thought I'd go for the summer uniform because, as, as I said, I can, you can build up build up on that into winter uniforms later, which is much easier than cutting back from winter uniforms. So there are some uniforms, and they're quite front line. So. That's that was the first lot because I thought that's they're obviously usable in games. That's why when I first looked at it, I was really excited about the Night Witches, but not sure how you can really use them in games. So I ended up going front line. So I went right. This is what it's going to start as because these are the obvious. Going to get my money back, and then I can put the money back into other things. So then there's a few comments of, "Well, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Are you going to do this uniform?" Like, yes, I am. I definitely am. Just need you to buy these ones first, <laughs> and then I can fund the rest of them. So they have gone very well, and that will definitely be happening. But it is a bit sometimes of a bit frustrating, maybe, of the whole wish listing type thing. Like, oh, but if you did this, this would be great. Like, but I've done this, and I will do this later. So. <laughs> Well, it, it, it is it is a classic thing. So, so immediately they come back and say, "Okay, so yeah, so why didn't you kickstart this then? <laughs> then you could have done it all at the same time." And then it had a total breakdown in the process. Yeah. I did think because this has been the most um, commercially, this has been the biggest thing already so far. You know, bigger than anything else I've done in terms of scale of figures and the rate at which people have been buying them and the mass they've been buying them. But then there was at the back of my mind of, mm, if this was a Kickstarter, this would have extra figures on the end of it because this would go nuts on Kickstarter. But no, <laughs> they're, they're out. They will be... I've been looking into the Kickstarter element of things and it, it does seem very interesting, but I like to be able to just release it and it's done. And I was a bit worried that this uh, sort of Kickstarter... Uh, what's the word? Froth. Environment. Uh, yeah. Uh, Shark pen. World. <laughs> <laughs> general general Kickstarter world that we're in at the moment. I was part of my pre-release, well, pre-pre-release stress is that the sales weren't going to be good because I do see a lot of people pumping money into Kickstarters, but then when you release something. And you go, look, I've, I funded it myself. I've been living off bread <laughs> for the last few months. I've poured all of my cash into this and I really could do with some help. And you get it released. 
and the sales just are nothing compared to what they would be if there was a Kickstarter. So mm. that was a massive fear. I thought maybe I should have kickstarted this, but it has done really well. So that's given me a bit more confidence to to continue doing what I'm doing. So even though I know that they would have they would have done a lot better on a Kickstarter, the initial wave, I think they're such a good product anyway. I'm so happy with them that in the long run they will anyway, and it'll be more sustainable. There's so many things that can go wrong with Kickstarter as well, because already the demand is crazy. And I've put I've put the official release date back by a week just to be cautious. Right. But if this reached the levels that some of those Kickstarters do, there's just all of those problems. And so this is stressful enough with the amount I've got. And I think, wow, I, I don't know if I could deal with it being even more and the people on Kickstarter being more demanding. You know, there's just, just so many things to take into account on them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's better just to do it at your time. Because, I mean, otherwise it is, you'd be it a, is a bit of a sharp bit, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, just imagine doing what you've just done with 500 people baying for information. And so so these, having to on. constantly, yeah, constantly, if, you know, if I have to set the release back, I can't see a ton of people, I can't see anyone really being, having a problem with it. But no. the demand on Kickstarter just seems to be that whole more and bigger and, and I'm one person. And, and, you, know, and the big, you missed and give it to me now because I am in yeah. <laughs> yes. the The bigger companies, you know, they've, they've got whole people working the Kickstarters while other people do this, you know, keep the running. If I've got to keep my shop running, keep my current releases going and run a Kickstarter, even if it was going to be a short one, it's just a lot for me because I'm currently working just that crazy work-sleep thing. I think I'm going to give myself something even more stressful. Because I was planning a Kickstarter after Salute. It's not Soviet. So it's, it was going to be something totally different. Um, but I've now decided I'm probably about 98% sure that I'm not going to do it. I'm not ruling out doing one in the future because I do see that there's a lot of benefits to it. But currently, I think because it was going to do a small one, it would be better to just take my Salute money and put it straight into it and release them. And know that, yeah, I'm not going to get that initial surge that you get with Kickstarter, but hopefully I've built up enough of a customer base now that I'll still get a nice initial amount and then they'll, you know, keep going at a steady rate that I can keep up with as well. Mm. So I don't so, have to hit a caster with, hello, can you cast me <laughs> a few thousand of these, please? And not be very popular. Yeah. So, so that, you, you mentioned you're going to do the, the winter. Um, versions. Are you going to expand the range any more into other sort of types of figures? Oh, you, uh, definitely. <laughs> are you thinking about doing um, part of them? Yes, they're they're actually next on my list. I've started with the the full on front front line type things, but there's just so much more I want to do. So this was a bit of a test because I thought if these do well, then it's a good sign. So there's going to be partisans. Um, what else have I got plans for? <laughs> Machine gunners. Uh, mortars, anti-tank, and more sort of. I'm more interested in more civilians as well, because yeah, it, I mean, it's yeah. it's been interesting looking at the through the propaganda and the the whole protect the motherland type thing. That there's so much glorification on this this front rank fighting to the point that you know there's women that know that they're not they're not ready to go to the front line or they've not got the experience or whatever. But they're still desperate to go because that's the that's the heroic, cool thing to do. So all these other jobs aren't seen as as cool, even though they are. You know, they're still really important jobs that people are doing. They're just not on the front line. So I don't want to reflect that in the miniatures either, and just sort of idolise the people there. You know, the, the brute strength and resilience going down on the front line and fighting when there's other people doing really important tasks that aren't as glorified and maybe don't get so much recognition. So I'd like to give those the recognition as well. I'm going to build the Soviet range, but I'd like to look, it's not as obvious, but look around all the other forces as well and see where I can put some models in, even if they end up being civilians. So there's the, in the UK, there's the anti-aircraft ladies, which again, I saw a photo and went, oh, these are brilliant. There's Andy, I didn't have no idea about these. But then you look into it and they're not allowed to pull the trigger. (laughs) (laughs) There's all the air transport auxiliary as well. Yeah, there's 
yeah. yeah, there's just tons. So they're not the obvious frontline fighters, but there's there's a lot more figures that you could still use. So I want to just sort of sweep around everywhere and sort of end up growing this into a really big World War Two range. Yeah, I mean, with with partisans, does anybody else make a range of of uh, Russian partisans? Um, I've seen because I've just been looking around, seeing what everyone else does. Uh, I've seen that there's a few packs of partisans, but they're all male. Yeah, I was, mm. was going to say, would you because you're, you're going to do f- female partisans? Would you do a matching range of male ones so that you've got ones from the same sculptor? Yeah, I, ha- I have thought about it. It's not at the top of the list, but it is something that I've been considering because, again, I don't want to stray too far from what I'm doing. But if the female partisans work better with the male partisans as well, because they wouldn't just, it would be weird to just have female partisans, you know? Yeah. So I've definitely been thinking about that. Mm. It's just then that whole load of other sculpting, because if you've got you know, uh, blank blank figures that you can make lots of different bits out of. Once I start using males, males, <laughs> male humans, mm. then I've got then I've got male blanks and sculpts that then maybe I'm a bit tempted to do more male figures. But maybe that's the way it goes. If they all fit in with the range for completion, then why not? You know. Well, yeah. I mean, if if you hit ranges and nobody's done before, I mean, obviously you've got the Russian partisan thing, but again, you could use those sort of blanks to do possibly the French part of sounds, you know. Oh yeah, definitely. Because again, you, and, and it's, it's getting you more into doing small self-contained, almost like chain of commands. Ranges. Yeah. Size ranges where you need, you know, 15 figures will probably, you know, do you, and, you know, do a couple of head swaps. Suddenly you've got a 30 figure, nice, there, yeah. there you go. It's a nice little, um, resistance um cell yeah all, all the same sculptor all all of the same weapons all all matching in yeah definitely there's a lot of um there's a lot of scope with the partisans to make some really really good characters as well so i've mm. been starting collecting information on real life you know resistance fighters partisans uh special agents to to base them on so they're it, not all just good. generic yeah, there was a really good program by the BBC um, about 15, 20 years ago called um, Allo, Allo, was it Neil? <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, I was like, listen, listen very carefully, I should say this only once. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think someone already does do some some figures for, for said television series. Um, the vague memory that Rob Down the Club has an army of French partisans, which include some very familiar looking um, uh. ladies. <laughs> so don't do them. So so do do it because I suspect you probably do them better. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, obviously, you have to have one that looks like Virginia McKenna. Mm. Okay. Oh, secret army. That's the oh, secret army. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, but but then again, we're back to it uh, a low low because we were saying wasn't the whole point with a low low was it? It was it was just a skit on Secret Army to begin with. Yeah, and we the, digress. Yeah, I think sorry. The- <laughs> I, I'm just thinking a, a, another one that would be quite interesting would be um, the Channel Islands. What do you mean? Well, when the the Germans invaded the the Channel Islands, there yeah. was a small resistance areas in there, wasn't there? Like, on Jersey, yeah, yeah, Jersey and Guernsey. Yeah, that could be interesting. Mm. That's definitely one to add to the uh, having a further look at. Yeah, I'll just have a heads later. Mike, you just think, <laughs> Mike, you're just going back to TV series again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can't help it. It's just what you've done. As I say, what 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 was that TV series about on the uh, on the German occupation of Guernsey? Come. Sorry, Jersey. I can't remember what it was called. No. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I, it was Bergerac. Was it Bergerac? <laughs> Yeah. No, it, it just popped in when, it, when we started talking about partisans and you know yeah. people fighting in the background. I'm not going to make all yeah. your favourite TV shows, Hobbs. <laughs> what my business is going to get? <laughs> well, 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 I mean, having said that, you you do have to do the iconic Russian partisan group, yeah, which are uh, uh, which are the ladies from um, Cross of Iron. That's because. That's the th- because that's the one that every because that's the one that every bloke knows about. Uh, get them. Yeah, yeah uh, quite. <laughs> <aren't they? laughs> no, Maybe a, not. You might be some... missing the point here, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. No, there's, oh, there's just so much more 
are um, so much more to look at now because I've, I've been focused. What I've done is what I've been focusing on. So now I've been very narrow viewed and you know looking at these front liners, and now I can go, okay, partisans. Now take a proper look at that. Mm, so yeah. start expanding my research and also looking at games as well and going what what units are actually useful in games so that I can sort of balance it out between figures that I know people will definitely buy because there's a gaming purpose for them and then the odd figure that I think, oh, I really want to do it. don't know if people will buy it. Maybe they will buy it just because it's cool or just to use it to dot around the board somewhere because that, that's kind of how I've been doing with the other ones. So the Catherine the Great figure was one that I kind of didn't really expect to sell. I just wanted to make it. I took a bit more money than I expected over Christmas because it was my, it was my first Christmas with the full shop, really. So it's a strange Christmas present to myself. It was the first sculpt I got Alan Marsh to do as well. It was a bit of a test sculpt. Um, I just wanted to have a Catherine the Great figure. So I thought, yeah, well, I'll get yeah, that. So I, I a bit that. of a present. I don't think... At the time, I thought, who's going to buy Catherine the Great? Anybody but, who has an imagination's army and wants well, yeah, to so, um, I released her again, and I thought, oh, well, we'll see, see you guys. Uh, I had no idea about the whole imagination genre at all, and I didn't realise how big Seven Years More Gaming was. And she flew out. I went, okay, <laughs> this is unexpected. Uh, I thought seven years, yeah, so, yeah, seven years were huge. Yeah, huge. I had no idea. I thought, oh, maybe a few people might. And, and again, <laughs> that, that was one where I was expecting the, the, wrath of, the wrath of historical gamers to come down on me, and people were coming up when I had her at Vapn Attack. And having a closer look, I'm thinking, oh no, <laughs> she's brilliant. Are you sure? There's there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> so I've been, been doing well, doing well so far with all that. The only reason but, I haven't bought one is I've failed to notice she existed because my imagination's army needs her. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, mate. You can buy one now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this has been quite a. Sort of change for you because I mean, when you've had to learn about the Russian campaign, which is not the easiest one to learn about, mm. um, especially when you start getting over into Manchuria as well, that's a whole other one. But you've also started playing World War Two gaming very, very slowly dipping in, mostly mm. because I've spent all my time researching World War Two and not enough time playing the game, which is more and more the case. The last time we spoke, I spoke about making sure I could put time aside to play more. And I think I've played less since then. But my, cur- my current goal is to play more again. Well, like, so, I mean, I, I, I'm quite happy to turn around and say that you haven't beat me this year. No, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> he played... Have you played him this year? He, he doesn't want to play me anymore. I think I'm, he's I'm, quit. Far, I'm, I'm far too busy. He told me he'd quit wargaming last time. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> no, no, Andy, at the moment, all you need to do is take up the polionics. Just for a few weeks, that's, just so he can help him out with his playtesting. That's harder than you think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll lend you the figures. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's a nice part of Napoleonic. It's got Indians in it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, back to World War Two. Annie, I don't know if I missed this uh, when we started talking about uh, this, uh, this whole new range and um, Project R, but what attracted you to World War Two in the first place? Because it's obviously quite a way away from Dark Ages. Yeah. So, so, so how did you get to World War Two? In that leap. Yeah. Well, it is different because the well, the whole range, the the medieval female miniatures, the shield maidens, that started because I was playing Saga, and I wanted some female figures for my Saga games. Right. So this time it's it's not happened because I wasn't playing World War Two. And for oh, I really need some women in my World War Two gaming. It sort of happened the other way around. So, because I work so closely around Great Escape Games, I've been watching them develop Iron Cross, and I've been involved for the last couple of years in some of the play testing and the big, huge games that they put on in Firestorm. So I've been playing bits, but not massive. You know, not massively playing it as a hobby. It's just sort of been around me, thinking yeah. this is interesting, and grow it's almost a slow build of interest because at the start I thought okay World War II is not my thing and I'm, I'm quite happy to say that up until relatively recently it's not been my thing so I yeah it's it's interesting in that way because I've not gone oh you know World War II is my life I absolutely love World War II this is why I've started doing this it's all rel- it was pretty new and 
I ended up, my interest started going up and up as I was learning about the women in World War II. And that that is an interesting part of it. So I've been playing a bit and now because of what I was doing, so I was playing it before it started to believe more female miniatures. And now that's that seems to be at the back of my mind with everything. It's like, how can I fit female miniatures into this? I was thinking, okay, World War II, but they are all chaps. Is there any place for this? And it, it wasn't an active thought or quest. And it wasn't until I was just browsing that book and thought, oh, this is brilliant. This can tie in with this. And now as soon as I'm learning about it, I really want to paint up Soviet force because I, I don't want to paint up an all women army. But knowing that I can mix and match them in, that's really exciting to me. And the gameplay is nice. And having that sometimes just part of the hobby element, having a mixture of figures to paint. So, you know, if you're just painting troops, whether they're Vikings or World War II infantry, they're kind of all the same. So you're just painting the same chaps. So having women in there is just everything else aside. It's, it's more fun to hobby. Do you know? Hmm. Yeah. So to fit them all in there. And as I was learning about these characters, I thought, these are, these are going to be brilliant to play and to relate it to real people. And I found that through learning about the women in World War II, learning about World War II in general, the whole wider aspect of it, just after so many years of not quite getting it, just sort of suddenly clicked. And my interest just came out of nowhere, I think, because of that. Which is an odd one, really, because I feel like for so long I've just said that's that's totally not my thing. No, nope, don't don't understand it. And then slowly, maybe I've been indoctrinated by Great Escape Games. <laughs> they sort of slowly gone, yeah, maybe, maybe. And yeah, now I'm really hoping that I can get some time off after Salute so I can get a Soviet force painted up mixture of. I'll probably end up using the Crusader figures or the Artisan, I'm not sure, because I'd look through some of those. And I'm, I'm interested actually later on, once because I want to focus on my own figures, because that there's a bit awkward sometimes with being a retailer and a manufacturer. So yeah. I'm showing off everyone else's figures, but then sometimes I'm going to have a spotlight on my own stuff. So currently I'm just spotlighting my own Soviets, but later on I'd like to do a couple of army deals with me because I can stock Artisan and Crusader. I'd like to get those in and build armies to go, here's the Iron Cross book and here's a Soviet force with a mixture of male and female figures. That would be quite interesting. To, to yeah, be I mean, able to sort of get, which I wanted to do with the Vikings that I haven't got round to yet either. You know, a six-point Viking force for Saga with, you know, the book, some shield maidens and some grip and beast plastics or medals. Yeah. I mean, the, the lucky thing is Russian um, forces in World War II, they're, they're tiny. Yeah. <laughs> really, really small. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've, you've definitely chosen the right one there. I only need a few of them. Yeah, but five, ten will be enough, I think. <laughs> plus, but, plus um, 34s. <laughs> So yeah, World War Two has has been a strange, strange sudden uh, explosion of interest because I had to stop myself a little bit because I had such a tight deadline to get all the figure, get all the details, such tiny details nailed on the figures, and I went off on quite a tangent of just learning about World War Two because I I didn't know that much about it. So, I, which sounds a bit crazy to say, it was, you know, there's the, the obvious things that people know and. Are, told at school but as soon as the very very shallow level of it's passed i just didn't have a clue and we went to the eastern front and that was just learning from scratch it wasn't rejigging anything it was just totally new learning hmm. um which is bizarre really so I thought, how how do i not know this <laughs> and i had quite a few discussions with people i knew about it um because I thought, maybe I, I just feel quite stupid, really, because all these people around me, but then I think the people that I surround myself with know so much about World War II. So maybe I'm not getting an accurate representation of your average person. So I started talking to people outside of it and their level of knowledge. And sometimes it is quite shockingly bad. So I thought I was quite terrible. But I think that I'm not that unusual, uh, especially for my age of 
knowledge. Yeah. And especially with, with the combat, because I think people do tend to learn more about the combat element because they're playing war games. Or maybe not. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure. It depends how sort of deep people go with their interest. But no, I, I mean, I think you're certainly right from a, uh, especially from a, like a generational point of view. I mean, it's something that um, we've talked about in the past. Uh, and like, I mean, I've talked about with um, with Henry in the past. Is that you know, uh, being blokes of a certain age, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, when we, you know, when you when you grew up and you started playing with stuff, you you natural, you know, your natural, the natural thing you you played was World War Two. Because, uh, you know, it was only, you know, to be fair, it's, 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 it's only one or two generations away. And, you know, you look at, uh, like around the time when, you know, we were, we were young, like all the kids comics and stuff, an awful lot of it was World War Two. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, I mean, all you had to do was move five or ten years and then all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes, yeah, yeah, it changes completely. Yeah, you know, it becomes sci-fi and comic book, and 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 it, yeah, it, that whole thing changes right around the time then. You know, I was a teenager, and you know, I mean, obviously, you got things like Star Wars and stuff has got an awful lot to do with that, and and, and what have you. The, the whole cultural phenomenon that are, that happens surrounding that, but prior to that, it was World War Two, and it's kind of what you grew up on. Yeah, but as you say. Obviously, we're old, <laughs> and you're not. <laughs> so I went through this whole thing, and I've had quite a few discussions online about it. Of um, there seem it seems to crop up relatively often now, where they say, "Why aren't there more young people?" And the, on TMP, there was a poll of, "How old are you?" And the average age was about sixty. I'm going, hmm, this is an interesting fact. And there was also that assumption T- that TMP P does have a certain degree of selection <laughs> bias, though. Uh, yeah, there is that. <laughs> Well, let's face it, it's web interface dates from 20 yeah. years ago. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> but just, just to look at that, and uh, there's, there is obviously a, uh, all that thread there was called the greying of the hobby and people being concerned that it was dying out. But I think things like that are just evolving. But I still think there's a whole um, barrier with some, well, uh, not World War II, just historical gaming in general, which some game systems are sort of, breaking down quite a bit, you know, like I was saying about Saga, that I used to, well, I, because I came to it with fantasy gaming, with Warhammer, which I think so many people do, and especially now still do, that when you start realising that people play historical, which I didn't really know about, because I just played Warhammer, the first one I went to, started playing at Firestorm about six years ago, <laughs> that I saw that people were playing all these historical games that I didn't know anything about. And they just feel very daunting because you you think, well, well, I don't know that era in and out. And I think maybe that's something that initially put me off of World War Two because I, I thought all these people, they know what all the tanks are, they know what all the weapons are. I don't know any of this stuff. And I just feel really stupid because these people do. And to some extent, it's the people do because they've spent so long learning about it. But it's... I think it's quite hard to be able to say, I don't actually know anything about it. Can you tell me? When there are some environments where people will be a bit of an ass that you don't know anything. So, well, how am I supposed to learn if you're going to be elitist about it? But I, I think that's the preconception that a lot of people have about historical gamers. And so far, I have found that not to be true. So once once I was able to sort of stop bluffing and kind of going, oh, yes, yes, I I, uh, I know about that, <laughs> to saying, no, I don't know. Can you tell me what this is and what does this do? And and it's actually fine. So I'm trying to tell more people that it is okay. And I think World War II was one which I was did have quite a big wall up on. And it's still, even though I've researched so much in the last few months, it's still a huge black hole when it comes to the gaming of, yeah, the weapons, the units, and simple things that I was panicking about before doing this because, okay, I learned a lot about the Soviet women, but just things like terminology to do with military terminology, World War II terminology, I don't know, and I was misusing words a lot, and I've probably misused words in this, but I think I've reached a good point of not caring and 
being okay to be corrected about it as long as people aren't rude, you know? Hmm. So I think that's that's something that maybe younger people need to see that it's it's not maybe that scary. Even though there are there are those people that ruin it though, and they're the people that some people will come across the first time they play a game or want to play a game, they just put them off forever. Yep, there are those who <laughs> Like my cops. Hello. And <laughs> to be honest with you, Annie, those guys have been around since I was a kid and probably before that. Indeed. Oh, yeah. They've, they've always been there and they always will. And you just got to get past them. You know, there's a lot of good breakthrough games now which are making historical periods a lot more accessible. Yeah. And, you know, Iron Cross is a great example of it. Um, and, and you have to say Bolt Action and Flames of War. Yeah. You know, are, are two other games. They're not the the greatest games out there, but they, you know, they they do make the information on on the periods quite accessible. Um, Getting people into it. Yeah, I mean, I I'm really looking forward to you to to you playing more World War Two because it gives a whole other period that you can beat me in. <laughs> yeah. But of course, of course, you then have to change the scale of your playing because you, uh, oh I'm, I'm 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 sorry, Mike. You play in three different scales, don't you? Well, we'll, we'll I was forgetting. Uh, yeah. One, two, four. Four. <laughs> sorry, I, so, sorry, sorry. I was forgetting. I was forgetting myself. What was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Don't you know who you're talking to? <laughs> well, you'll you'll have to do twenty eight mil so I can beat you in that. Oh, I've oh, been... oh he's got. Uh, oh, 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 he's got twenty eight. <laughs> have you got? Have you got twenty eight mil Germans? I got Paul Schumacher. Ah, uh, oh, oh, that'll do. That'll do. Oh, 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 no, actually, they won't. <laughs> no, but I, I am going to no. do. Um, I'm, I'm going to do the later war Germans, the artisan ones that are, that are stew cells, ones in grey coats. So, ah, uh, oh, 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 that that'll be fine. So, so when he, so when Annie <laughs> releases her 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 winter clothing, uh, her winter clothes yeah. range of, uh, th- then you'll be able to play her. Yeah. Well, hopefully, it won't yeah. be that long. Great Escape Games have been talking about, oh, what board should we do next for our World War Two? So I've been sort of going, Stalingrad, definitely do Stalingrad. Because <laughs> I want to get all my great coat ladies in Stalingrad, I think that would be great. Stalingrad, again, would be a really interesting one, because um, wasn't there a story about the the, the people in the in the factory driving the tanks out? Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of them were the women working in the tanks. Oh, there was a whole lot of tanks ready, yeah. drive it out, fire in. Yeah. <laughs> tank. yeah. Don't bother painting it, just just drive it out. <laughs> yeah. Off you go. I suppose we'll have to show you chain of command as well, because a, a, a Russian force for that is only 30 people. Uh, and it's a nice, easy one to start with. Yeah, it's one squad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, more, more systems for me to beat you in. We definitely do need to play, because I haven't played anything for some time. I've been trying to get some Iron Cross organised, but they're always doing playtests at the minute. I just want to have a bit of a, a Soviet game. They haven't been doing any scenarios that are particularly East at the moment. So I've started um, I've started making my Soviet force, but they've, they've got as far as being filed and stuck on bases, and that's about it. But I've seen there's a, a new Saga campaign coming out, so that's made me want to do Saga again now. So I'm going to flip between the two. Because I still haven't played... I've played one game, I think, with you, Mike, where I played with my Shield Maidens. I'm not sure... Yeah, I'm not even sure if I used my Shield Maidens for that. No, I used... Um, you played Maybe Rust, I, used your, I think I used your, your stuff, yeah. Yeah. So I still haven't played a game with the figures that I have manufactured to play with. So I was thinking, mm, maybe for this cap, we could get some saga campaign happening at Firestorm, and uh, I can actually try and paint up a force with a load of shield maidens in it. That'll be down. great. I look that forward to that. You can tell that from his voice, got you. Yeah. I look forward to that, like a hole in the head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saga campaign? Are there some saga campaign rules? Uh, yeah, yeah we've been released at Salute. Uh, uh, yes, on. written by Warwick and Ride, mate. Well, I, I managed to get hold of a copy today, and then I was going to brag to Hobbs Ooh. that um, I had a copy and found out that he's got a copy as well. So I've lost my hands, hands up. Hang on, where's mine? There. Where's mine? Come on, come on, come on, <laughs> yeah, come on guys, where's mine? But we can play <laughs> Hobbs, and then we can annoy everyone by playing our saga campaign really early. <laughs> uh, have you got the uh, paper one or the PDF? PDF. Oh, but oh, yeah. you've got a paper one. No, I've got PDF. Got, yeah. <laughs> it hasn't been printed yet. <laughs> well, well, I've got a print. Just copy, 
I've got a pre-release copy of the Dux Britannium Arum Compendium, so there. Uh, yeah, but you, yeah, but you are you're writing it. That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> And I've end. been on um, my my other beating Hobbs quest has been trying to get more more book mentions than Hobbs as well. So I've got <laughs> <laughs> trying to get as many book credits. Uh, which, oh, what yeah. is in the what is in the and thanks to? Oh yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of credits in Iron Cross actually. I'll point that out. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point I'm going to do there was a very vague um, game that I was working on but it's because of the Soviets and all the other things it's being realistic it's, it's not going to be this year so maybe it, then maybe it'll be next year's salute thing um, so there's a little bit of cheeky information but I thought well if I'm going to do my own book I can <laughs> credit the crap out of myself <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm going to get a credit an Annie Norman production director <laughs> Annie Norman fighting Annie Norman Artwork, Annie Norman, with an Annie Norman helping. <laughs> well, obviously, I'll get loads of people in, but I'll have a, an Annie Norman everywhere. Yeah. Their tea maker, Annie Norman. I tried to get Baggy some credits. I tried to get Baggy a credit in Iron Cross, but I think they took it out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Moose no trainer. For him. Moose trader, trainer. Moose trainer. <laughs> oh, come, come on, people, keep what? up. It's going to no. take me about 20 years to catch up with Hobbs and all his book credits. Every time I get yeah. a book credit, he seems to have two book credits. So. I think he just oh, sneaks his way in them. everywhere. It's, it's, it's because he's uh, he just playtests everything, doesn't he? Yeah, so he's actually, probably going to get a credit. Yeah, that's the one. He'll end up with a credit in my book anyway, but I'll make sure I counteract it by giving myself more credits. Talking of credits and uh, artwork, I've got a guy, um, Greg Taylor who's uh, doing a Soviet painting for me at the moment, which uh, was a, another little treat that I thought, ah, let's do it. Uh, I've been selling the battle runes, these little discs that you put under figures. They're quite, quite simple, and it's his own artwork. And they're for statuses, so they're, they're made for role play. but I've been selling them as part of the Frostgrave sort of collective stuff. So they're tokens, but instead of putting next to something and cluttering up table, they're sort of auras that go around the bases. <laughs> Oh, and okay. I got chatting to him because of that, and then looking for his website. Oh, he's really good. So he's a fantasy artist. So in my usual last minute rush, I've managed to commission him to do a Soviet painting, which should, fingers crossed, be ready for salute as well. So that's that's been really interesting. And being an artist and commissioning another artist has been a an interesting thing to do. From being because it's it's been like that being on the other side commissioning the sculpts but commissioning a painting is even stranger really but he's, he's already making some progress on it it's looking amazing I thought it'd be nice to just have some really strong artwork to go with the whole range yeah and after that i try and get a, a shield made and done as well and i can add that to all my little merch because i've been working on my baggy the badge ba- uh, baggy the bag merchandise last week which you might have seen up and around the internet the uh my little uh, mascot oh, oh, oh. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so they're little things, like the badges and key rings and things. For if I can add to that, it's more little bits and bobs we can get. Um, I wanted to point out the pre-orders for the Soviets as well before I forget, because that ties in. Go on. So talking of Baggy the Bag merchandise, um, it's a small incentive, but it's it's a good incentive that the people that pre-order the Soviets. Even and if you just pre-order one pack, you can get a 58 mil baggy the bag, Soviet baggy badge, which is exclusive only to people that have pre-ordered. There won't be any more of them. And it's just a small thing, but it's just a thanks for being the sort of first people in and supporting, I guess, in the same way that something like a Kickstarter would do if we're the first sort of people thing. And the more that they get, because we've still got uh, just less than a month, I'll probably add another badge in there as well. Or maybe upgrade it to a key ring as well. Oh, so easy that's exciting stuff. But I've been, if you have a look on the website and on social media, I've been doing all sorts of things with Baggy and the Squidows and their uh, tank adventures. Don't mention the tank. Whatever you do, <laughs> don't mention the, one, the tank. The one with the wrong tracks? Yeah. Oh, you were that. Uh, oh, <laughs> there was a huge drop. <laughs> yeah, I, had to go there. I don't do strops. You did. You had a real stop. What's wrong with this tank? <laughs> that was a genuine question. I spent so long on this 
uh, T-34 that Baggy is riding, and the first thing that comes up is Hobbs saying that the tracks are wrong. Oh, that- don't, oh don't, don't tell me you copied it from a film. No, I copied it from no. some. I've copied it from someone's model. So. Yeah. Oops! <laughs> but, uh, it was I did, perfect. I had to go there. No, I did. I did have to because I'd spent weirdly. You, you hit a nerve because I'd spent so long trying to stylize yeah. it yeah, down because it was because there's so many little grooves. I thought I'm gonna do all that detail. I'm sure no one will notice. Hobbs. Oh no 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 no. Not oh the, no. the, not the squiddo tank riders are historically inaccurate or anything. They were fine. They were perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> and then we got into the battle of was it Bag- Bagastovia or something. Bag Bagiration. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, 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 Operation yeah. Baggeration. Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. oh, yeah, the, the, uh, some sort of uh, made-up battle, anyway, about Baggy and the Squiddos. The Squiddos that fought in World War Two and didn't get any recognition, which was a, which is a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> the Soviet female range... Well, um, wave one. As of this week, yeah, yeah, wave one, yeah, uh, yes. As of this yeah. week, as opposed to last week when we were, we were meant to have this conversation, is now going to be available um, for people at Salute. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's on up the for, day. Yeah, it's up for pre-order now. So if you right. pre-order it for Salute, you um, you get your special edition baggy badge, but you also get a thing. It's just a general Salute. Is this going out before Salute, <laughs> or will it be after uh, Salute? Y- no, this will be going out before Salute. Okay, cool. Um, so anything that you pre-order from the website, you get, there's a whole load of information on there about it in the salute post, but you get a thing called baggy credits. So the more that you pre-order, the more baggy credits you get, which you can then trade for the merchandise, all the new merchandise and the old merchandise. So it's worth, if you know you definitely want something, you can pre-order, get some free stuff and get your free badge, but you can also pick it up on the day as well while stocks last (laughs) and it will be available for full release, uh, officially the 25th of April, but due to demand, that official release, if you're ordering now rather than the people that have ordered before, will probably be the 2nd of May. Right. But you can pre-order at any time for that. And obviously, the sooner you pre-order, the sooner you'll get your thing. So I suppose this is the problem, is it? Because... Um... Every single caster in the UK is just manic. Oh, <laughs> getting ready for salute. So, yeah, it's it's crazy now. It's the same with trying to get all my restocks in time for salute because every, nearly everyone is there. So they're all casting up for themselves at the moment. They're still casting up their trade orders, and it's all just a bit manic. So I'm making sure I've got. I should have a nice amount for salute. Um, I know how crazy it'll be because of last year. <laughs> That I, I don't know how long they'll last. Hopefully, they'll uh, I'll have enough that everyone can have some. But if you definitely, definitely want some, pre-order is definitely recommended. Or come and scramble first thing. <laughs> um, yes. I'm actually, as you go in at Salute, I'm just... It'll all be gone by yeah. half past 12. Yeah, uh, no, yes. The whole lot, and I can close up and go home. But yeah, as you go into Salute, the whole map and everything's on there, but it's literally just turn left. And I'm right, in, right as you go in, which is a nice spot. So hopefully that will work out super good as well. Because the more I make it salute, as soon as I've paid all my bills after that, it's going straight back into Soviets. And and the secret project that was going to be a Kickstarter, but will probably just be released in May now. So that will be funded as well with the salute cash. So it all keeps going back into it. But it's this now... I've, it's. I feel very confident that I've got this steady release plan now for all these different bits, which is really exciting. So as soon as I get money, I'm like that's going there, that's going there, and sculptors and painters are getting it all now. <laughs> so They're quite what's happy. Not the release plan that isn't secret. It's all pretty much secret, really. Well, the Soviets. The the next ones will be partisans and some gun crew. I'm not sure exactly which ones yet. Machine gunners and mortars. Um, I was going to do just the crew, but I think for completion, I should have the weapon as well. So I spoke to the sculptor about that, and he's quite happy to to do that. So there'll be full teams. Because I thought there's no point having to buy the male team from somewhere else with the gun, just to then replace them all. So, no. so yeah, they're the next ones and the partisans. And I'm hoping I'll be able to make the partisans in a way that they can be converted for to just make a million partisans. Because there's so many of those I want to do. And, and, and then, then start the moving secret, across. Secret thing that isn't a Kickstarter. Yeah, 
um, and, and then probably just more Soviets. There's still other ones I want to put in, so I like the idea of just the occasional random release of uh, just a woman from history like the Catherine the Great that just doesn't quite fit in necessarily with my full ranges, but I want to do and she's cool sort of thing. Um, I have yeah. got a very lovely green, which should be coming out after Salute as well, um, which is Fantasy. Which oh, I've is seen those. also a secret. It's just one. It's just one. Um, there are some other ones. <laughs> I probably shouldn't just keep it all secret. Um, I have some secret things that will be at Salute. They'll probably be made clearer in the next couple of weeks, just when I make sure I've got some. But it's nice to be able to turn up because you know the Soviets are going to be there. It'd be nice to turn up at the stall and see something that you didn't know about. So yeah. I've got... I will have a very small amount of something brand new and secret in there as well, which hopefully people will go, ooh, that's very nice. So I've got Paul, Paul Cubbin painting those at the moment, and I've got Andrew Taylor painting the Soviets. So I've got a nice sort of Annie factory going on of people squirreling away on things, which is really good. It's nice to be able to point different people to different things and sort of just manage it all rather than, you know, that contrast of just doing the dice bags and everything being me all the time it's nice to have people you know feeling like i've got someone doing some sculpting some a couple of people doing some painting someone else doing some artwork for me and i do all the boring web work <laughs> <laughs> do all the managing and hair pulling it's, it's amazing what you've what you've done in the first year i mean you've literally yeah. from nothing, you know built up this this whole industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I had a big ton of money and then I could hire all my people and have little Annie Towers there and just pay them full time to just keep painting and sculpting things. That would be great. Maybe next year. <laughs> it's good finally sort of feeling like it's settling into a routine now of knowing what, what people are going to be working on. You know, setting yeah. sculptors on, you know, this range is sort of yours, this is the bit that you do. And... Now I've got other painters as well that's less work because Paul Cubbin and uh, John Morris have been painting for me so far. Now I've got Andrew Taylor as well. So I'm never never feeling like I'm waiting for things or those queues because obviously painters, like so many people in the industry, have got big queues of people demanding their time. So to be able to sort of spread them across lots of different people is good as well. And for them to not go crazy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Paint all these things in a day, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Now, when some people found out that you were coming on, uh, there was, uh, uh, I think Mr. Hobbs ran uh, uh, an Ask Annie. <laughs> I, I, I think um, um, Annie thread. did this. You just did this last week. Like, you know, yeah. just, just post your questions for me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so over to Mr. Hobbs. We, we have a few questions for you since, since people knew you were coming on. Yes. Somebody, it's not many. <clears throat> Actually, one has been answered, which is from Phaser, which was, um, the name change. Now you're not making dice bags, but you've sort of covered that. Yeah. So, um, Phaser, that's been done. Right, okay. Uh, and then Thomas, good old Thomas from, uh, that there, um, Scandinavia. Cause I can never remember if he's from Sweden or Norway. And it's a massive insult if I oh. say the one. Why not? I thought he was Switzerland, but maybe I've got it wrong as well. We've all offended that's him it. now. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's it. He'll never listen to us again yeah. now. We're, we've Hobbs really Hobbs gone and done it. Come for you. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's Scandinavian. <laughs> so, so Thomas asks, three questions. Planned expansions, will you be making crew, pilots and drivers? Actually, you haven't mentioned drivers. Are you going to do drivers? I am definitely going to do drivers. Um, that's another one that's in the whenever point. So there's the, I've got a full spreadsheet of what I want to do. And it's almost like a little unlock thing. So I make X amount at salute and it's going into these set things. And then if I make more, it's going into these things as well. So I guess people that like Kickstarters could say that salute was a Kickstarter. And the more you buy, the more things. Um, yes. Yeah. Stretch goals. <laughs> stretch goals. Yeah. Secret, secret um, stretch goals. Yes. Yeah. At yeah. lunchtime, I shall release. <laughs> There is a very, very strong reason I definitely want to do a driver and the pilots I want to do as well. I, I don't know what you do with them in a game and that's why I want to look more into games, but I guess you just use them as sort of just stand around people or civilians or 
yeah. uh, just dismounted? Do they fight, you know, as if they've landed and now they're fighting? That's something else I need to research. You can make a nice little scenario around um, a pilot that's crashed and you're, you know, you've got your army just trying to capture. The, one, one side's trying to capture the pilot, the other side's trying to rescue the pilot. True. Another thing with the figures as I've been making them is, as well as gaming, thinking of the diorama purposes, because obviously lots of people like World War II dioramas, so I think the tank riders and things work well for that. So mm. with the pilots, I think, well, they just look cool, so I'm sure plenty of people will buy them to paint because they look cool. Yeah. Which which also works. The larger scales, when I was researching, the larger scales have some amazing figures. And the representation of women in those scales is so much different to Wargaming, to the 28mm and smaller range. So that's sort of 54 and up. There's some there's some great female tank tank riders, tank commanders, sniper figures. Really good. Which was a yeah, surprise. But that's, yeah, but that's, that's because you're more into... It, it just becomes a different thing. Mm. That's yeah. Mm. That's that's modern. That's modelling as opposed and, and to also gaming. Yeah. Twenty eight mil and down, you start having to exaggerate things before they're actually noticeable. Whereas at fifty four mil, you can get away with it. Yeah, it's a weird. One. I think I've done well. Well, the sculptor has done well in our sort of communication of making something that Hobbs said when he first saw the figures is that you know that they're women. But it's it's subtlety. I, that's why I think he's done them really well. He's subtly done them, so you know that they're women, but not you know that they're women because they've got massive hair and chests, and it's just the slight differences in builds, and that's what's worked well because I think it's very easy. And I've learned this already sometimes with the figures where I've gone, hmm, actually, how do if you took the head away, how do you know it's a woman with with things? So yeah, get, getting it just right of those those slights without falling into the trap of hmm, well if we just hourglass it a bit more and before you know it, it's, the, uh... it's the shoulder pads. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> that that caricature type thing. But I think that is fine at twenty. I think you can do it at twenty eight mil. That was my reservation when people were talking about fifteen that it mm. would start getting to that point of yeah, but they do just look the same at fifteen mil. <laughs> Don't even bother doing 15. Yeah. <laughs> or 20. Yeah, go on. I, I want to see you do six. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do two mil. <laughs> All right. Next question. From That'll Tom please Mike. Sydney. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, this is one you probably have to put onto the show notes, but he's asked uh, suggested reading for research. Oh, yes. We yeah, might have you to um, give us a list and we'll check up on the show notes. Yeah, I'll put it in. That Soviet Women on the Frontline book is absolutely the best. But um, I'd like to say as well, uh, Frank Shandy of The Raft, he actually recommended me a lot of the books that I've got. So I'll give him a little shout out as well. Because he is my go-to librarian for these sort of matters. So he helped out from the start, which he did help out from the start originally with the Shield Maidens. So I'd like to thank him for that. Well, that completes the listen the mailbag. Okay. <laughs> I, hope, I hope all those people were uh, informed. Well, Andy, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, th- thank you for coming back on. It's been it's been great to chat again. Uh, uh, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, find out all about the, uh, uh, the this new range of Soviets you're doing and um, and, well, and everything to look forward to for the future that you could tell us about. Reminding me, I need to buy a Catherine the Great. Indeed. Yes, yes, everyone needs to buy Catherine the Great. Pre order Soviet. I, 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 I may have to send a minion to pick me one up at yeah. salute because I can't currently don't know if I'm going or not. Okie dokie. Right, okay. Uh, uh, okay, I'll. Okay, I shall paint myself yellow and wear a pair of dungarees. Yes. There's a mental <laughs> image of God, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and on that note <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me back hopefully it's been interesting and not just a stuttery ramble but no no it's been, it's been great to chat again Annie. and as I, said, I mean you know congratulations on uh, so the first year of Bad Squid though yeah. just surviving the first year <laughs> indeed uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's cost me my sanity a little bit but so that's the first test, apparently. If you don't go insane in the first year of miniatures, you might be okay. <laughs> yeah. The second year is just bad. The third year, apparently, it sort of levels off. 
<laughs> you just get used to it, then. Yeah. Mind you, um, as for rules writing, look at Rich Clark. That is true. Look at Lord S. He's been doing this like for 25 years. <laughs> he only looks 20, so... <laughs> I was going to say, just look down to 75. Uh, that's, that's, that's the mirror in the back end of the moulding room, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, the painting. Yeah, so, so yes, Annie, so, uh, yeah, many thanks. Uh, it's been great to chat. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a chance to, to catch up again soon. Yeah, when I've launched uh, all my other top secret things. Yes, when you've launched, uh, yes, yes, when you've got something you can tell us about. Well, about no. uh, 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 you know, rather than coming on saying, oh yeah, I'm doing this, but I can't tell you about that. I'm doing this, but I can't tell you about that. Well, the, the Soviets, <laughs> the Soviets worked so well on just appearing, you know, launching them out of nowhere that I want to just keep doing that. But no, I've told you. I've told you there's going to be more Soviets. There's uh, going to be another secret thing and another secret thing. There you go. Indeed. Right. Well, <laughs> we, should look, we, should, we should look forward to the secret things. It's just and, to get uh, you to have me back on again, and I can tell you about the secret thing when it's all out. See? She's not stupid. <laughs> <she's been this laughs> <one>. no. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Uh, fantastic stuff. Well, uh, as I say, um, all the best, and uh, if not before, we'll catch uh, uh, we'll catch up with you at Salute. Okay. And we should look forward to seeing the secret stuff yeah. that we will have that uh, on, on your stand, which we haven't, uh, which which you haven't told us. Well, about. I've got to lure them all over, but make a stampede happen, haven't I? If you know what oh, it's okay. going to be, then you can make a decision. Like, oh, maybe I won't, maybe I will. But if you don't know what it is, you have to have it, then, haven't you? <laughs> that's it. So, um, so what is it? In, into the door and turn left. Is yeah, that, that's it, literally it, it. Just on the okay. left. Okay. End of salute. Turn left, uh, and uh, yes, get get all your open, ba- open bad your wallet goodness. and say, "Please, Annie, help yourself." <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed, excellent. Well, thanks a lot. It's been nice. Okay, cheers, and uh, say, we'll, uh, uh, if not before, we'll catch up at salute. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> It's time to hear from you as we open up the Meeples and Miniatures mailbag. And welcome back to the mailbag. Uh, this feature's been away for a couple of, uh, for a couple of shows. But uh, we're back answering, uh, uh, or catching up on our ba- uh, uh, a bit more on our backlog. But obviously, uh, if you've got questions for us, uh, then uh, please feel free to uh, to mail us in uh, at info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. So, what have we got in store for us this time? Okay, so first off, uh, we have a question from uh, Robert Engel, and this one is actually specifically for Mr. Whittaker. Uh, uh, and he basically says, Mike, can you please uh, explain and maybe post a link to where you can get we can get custom printed cards? Uh, because the last time he was he was tried listening to it and he basically couldn't understand what we were saying. Right, the site in question is artscow dot com. Can you spell that, please? A R T S C O W dot com. Uh, they're actually based, I believe, in Hong Kong, um, and they do. They're actually a, you name it, we'll print on it kind of site. But one of the things they do do um, is custom decks of playing cards. So you're limited to fifty-two card decks, but you can actually customize both the front and the back which basically means that you can produce any set of cards you want, provided you can generate some artwork for it. Ooh. Now, what they have online is a rather nifty little web base. It's actually using Flash Card Designer, where you can just drag and drop your artwork in. So I've done sets of cards for I Ain't Been Shop Mum, I've been working on a set of cards for the Sharp Practice War of the Roses variant, which I haven't finished yet. Anybody who went to Operation Market Laden 2 will have seen the custom Bloody Omaha cards I produced. Those were Arts Cow. 
basically, it's a really nice, simple system, and I'm, I'm trying to drag through my order history and actually find out how much the last lot cost. But memory serves, they're literally of the order of 12 or 15 quid for a pack. And that's, in, that's, that's including shipping? That's, I believe, including shipping. Just give me a second. Well, considering, yes. considering that's coming coming from the other side of the world, that ain't bad. And they're, they're, they're pretty damn quick. The other thing is it's a bit like ordering from Wargames Foundry they, or Vistaprint. They usually have discounts. <laughs> and the trick is to look out for a discount voucher uh, because you usually get 20 30% off most things. Uh, once you've actually created an account, they'll send you send you discount discount offers fairly regularly. Um, and I love them. They produce. They're really nice, professional quality cards. They print right to the edge, so they don't they don't look naff like you've done them on a printer. You don't have to do any cutting or anything. They just come nice deck of cards, 50, 54 cards including jokers, printed how you want both sides, in a in a box, ready to roll. Cool. I so we- my my deck of bloody Omaha cards, which were a single pack were, oh, I tell a lie, they were $13 um, plus <laughs> um, plus eight ninety nine shipping, less four ninety coupon discount, so a grand total of 18 bucks, or at that, that, at that time's exchange rate, about 12 quid. Shimples. You can't say fairer than that, can you? You can't say fairer than that. They're, oh. they're very, very nice. There are, if you, particularly if you're of the lardy persuasion, if you hunt around in the files area, of the, the links area, I seem to remember that um, whoever maintains the the Lard web aggregation site, I think it's Derek Hodge. There are links to arts cow projects that are available for anybody to to buy one of that will basically get you quite a lot of useful cards for some of the games. Um, so yeah, go for it. They're great. I love them. Cool. Well, oh, Robert, I hope that's answered your question, and you got the URL this time round. But we'll put it in the show notes. Yes, link will be in the show notes. Indeed, it's in the document already. Marvelous. Okay, next question. This is from uh, Marcus Wheeler. Hello, Marcus. And you uh, made a comment as if to flag up the creeping preoccupation with um, intellectual property and licenses, because uh, we have seen. Um, it seems that uh, every company must have uh, some IP somewhere, as we've seen with the likes of you know, Terminator, Genesis, and Walking Dead, etc., 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 in recent months. Which licenses are conspicuous by their absence from the wargaming world? And would you like a game of them? What do you think, guys? Michael Moorcock. Ooh, excellent, excellent suggestion, you man. Um, TSR had them for first edition D and D. Yeah, but that was about oh, many, ago, yeah. many years ago. But um, in fact, I remember those. They did the Elric ones, and I think they got converted and become elves. Um, I think one of the things that happened is if you find the first edition of Deities and Demigods, they're in, and yeah. I think both the Elric and the Cthulhu things got taken out of the second printing because the, they got jumped up and down by various people's estates. Yeah, I, but... I, I, I was in, they did it without permission. Oops. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, think they, they, I think they uh, had permission yeah. for a short while. They, they didn't renew it. Uh, but, okay. yeah, anybody who picks up any of the Michael Moorcock, I mean, the, the whole universe... Not just Elric, you've got, you know, you've, you've got Hawkmoon, you've got Camp Brass. Jerry um, Cornelius. Jerry Cornelius, I mean, yeah, which, which are great stories. Yeah, you know, you've got fantastic stories, and yeah, to have them as a game. Yeah, but or, I, I, I must admit that the, the whole... With, yeah, with Hawkwind playing at incredibly high volume in the background. Yes, definitely. The whole thing with the, uh, the whole thing with, uh, uh, the Hawkmoon series and the armies, where you've got all the different parts of the armies all having different, uh, uh, all having different helmets, uh, you know, different um, animal helmets based on what they are. Mm. Um, I mean, I mean, that has always struck me as being an absolute, you know, a, you know, a really excellent thing for a miniatures range, and no one's ever really seen to have gone and done well, it. They sort of have, if you Ish. don't mind the figures looking Vikingish. Use the figures from the Blood Rage game because they've actually got five or six different clowns, each with different animal-themed helmets. 
Mm. Yeah, but that's kind of dark age as opposed to kind of like you know full high medieval sort of stuff. Which true, is, true. Which is, which is kind I'm of what I ima- we, Im- it must be in my mind's eye. That's kind of what I imagine the army from from uh, War Moon to be like. It's quite quite funny how people's minds eye work, isn't it? Because I don't. I always imagine quotes fantasy um, battles as being more dark ages than high medieval. But that's just me. Oh, uh, well, it, yeah. It, it, that's it, just it, Neil's pre-obsession with heavy cavalry charges. No, it's the John Borman in me. That's <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's uh, that's the problem. Charge. Yes. But there you go. If somebody could do or pick up the IP for the Eternal Champion, um, set of stories. I mean, there's about fifty odd books he wrote. Oh, it's, it's, that that well, seems, doesn't he? Well, basically, in the end, it was. It, it basically, in the end, everything he wrote was essentially. The Eternal Champion series. Oh, probably yeah. with the exception of Dancers at the end of time. I think that was when they came together. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. But yeah, the yeah. series when they all, they all, all six of the Eternal Champions all came together into one. Yes. Has anyone done anything with Game of Thrones yet? Uh, there is a massive yes. range of figures from Reaper, or is it Dark Sword? No, it's Dark Sword. Dark Sword. Dark Sword. Are they actually? They are. They are Board games. There are no yeah, war board games. games. That's why we're no. talking about a war game. Here. Is anyone actually? Is there anything out there that's actually licensed by them yet? No, not, no, no. not officially. I mean, I mean, basically, you've got. I mean, there's loads of people who've done. I mean, even like in, in last month's, uh, in last month's miniature uh, war, uh, war games, there was somebody wrote a whole article on, on you know doing Game of Thrones. But having said that, loads of people turned around and went, "Well, why not just use Dragon Rampant?" And, you know, there's been, uh, so, yeah, there's been lots of, there's been lots of kind of fan written stuff, but, but uh, as far as I'm not, I'm that's it, no official. commercial. No. I imagine the license for that would be astronomical. Though. Well, especially, con- yes, especially considering its current popularity. I mean, perhaps, perhaps before they actually started doing a TV series of it, um, it might, it might not have been quite this expensive. Well, it, it does bring in the question of which IP would you buy? Do you, do you buy the IP of the books, which gives you open, you know, similar to what Mantica when they bought the IP for the comics, or do you try and buy the IP for the TV show, which means you're going up against, you know, yeah. whoever whoever produces Fox. But producer. let's face it, Spartan have proved it's possible to get IP for some pretty pretty big guns if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Obviously, the other thing is it also depends on the what type of IP. The, uh, what type of license that Fantasy Flight currently own for mm, that yeah. series? Because obviously, you know, there are they do license very stuff. Very interesting of licensing concepts going on with, with FF. Because if memory serves, wasn't isn't there a restriction that effectively they can't sell some things that they might want to sell for X Wing because they have a war game license, not a board game license, or vice versa? No, yeah, they have a board game li- Yes, that's the whole reason why. Um, when you bought X Wing, you didn't get a mat. Yes, because that then it's a, then then it's not then it's not a war game. Uh, interestingly, it, 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 because before they did Battle Law Second Edition, either either one with the twenty eight mil version, the version of Battle uh, they did a version of Battle Law. Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but basically it was Game of Thrones because they were uh, because they were yeah you know, they were actually using the Game of Thrones IP. So when they originally bought Battle Law um, from Days of Wonder, and then start, uh, yeah, they they produced. I, I don't know if it's still available, but uh, but they produced another game whose name escapes me. But it was called something a Battle Law game, but the IP was Game of Thrones, uh, and 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 they were using figures. So but very that, close to to being a war game. Well, well, it's uh, I mean, yeah. it's, you know, uh, I say it's a board game. It's different. Mm. Honest. Of course it is. <laughs> Despite right. the fact it's you know, got figures and everything. But yeah. So. I've got two or three. Go on then. Um, well, what is Black Sails? Um, but it looks yeah. as though what you'll do is, is you know, that the Blood and Plunder game will be perfect for it, I suspect. And I, and if I were them, I'd have tried. But given, given the... Uh, it's probably not an easy one to get, given it's quite a big show... I don't know if it would work, but I'd be interested to see what someone could do with the setting. Um, the Amazon Man in the High Castle series. Mm, that's a good one. Mm. Ooh, that's a really, it's a really dark setting. 
I haven't seen that. Is that the alternative? That's the one that's based on the Philip K. Dick novel. That's yes. basically an alternate post-war America in which there is an independent strike down the middle. Japan own the West Coast, and Nazi Germany owns the East. Ah. Based in based in nineteen sixty two, which oh. I, I, yeah I thought that yeah or sixty 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 two something like that, but I, yeah I thought the series was absolutely brilliant right up to the last episode when it turned into Fringe. I'd be I interested to see it. where they go from there. Yes, but I, I I do. I, if I can aside for a minute, um, it's worth getting a one month Amazon trial free trial subscription just to watch it. It is good. It's it is that good. It, it, it is really <laughs> good. And uh, there's a uh, oh crikey who. who who plays the main Nazi? Uh, uh, it's oh, what's oh, his name? Oh, but he's brilliant. You mean Ober Gruppenfuhrer Smith? Indeed. Which, um, is a, which is just such. Oh, his name sums up the show. That's uh, done in all seriousness and really scarily well. Yeah, and and funny enough, he's funny enough, he's an English actor. He is <laughs> an English actor playing a bad guy in an American series. Who'd have thought? It's, it's, it's <laughs> brilliant. Um, the other one, and and there's a part of me going. Hmm, I wonder at this is is anybody fancy an official Ducks Brit supplement for Vikings the TV series? Yeah, that, that would work. I mean, it's the- an interesting thing is it's either that or Saga. They're both about the right size because if you watched Vikings, it's mm. very warbandy. I know Chris Sturson, I think, did a Vikings as in not Vikings TM supplement on one of the Lardies sort of specials. Yes, uh, the guys uh, who behind Blood Raven, uh, yeah. the the sh- the game which I believe they're putting on at Salute is actually a game is actually a a, a warband game based around the village from the series. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Uh, so, but but uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. To a degree, that that one's almost too easy. In that you yeah. almost don't need the IP, and, and, all you need is the and, figures. And to be fair, there are quite a few of the figures um, starting to appear anyway. Oh yeah, yeah, and there are. Places. And there's, 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 nice, there are too. You could equally do something with the BBC's Lost Kingdom, Last Kingdom. Yeah, but I think to be honest, those are more a case of you really on. They're historical. You don't need a. You don't need to buy the IP to do them. Just run them yourself. Use your imagination. Mm. Yeah. I'm trying to think about other big IPs out there which haven't been picked up. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, there's a couple of new sci-fi TV series, uh, Killjoy and Expanse, which I suspect might work. But again, you're really into the realms of do you really need yet another custom rule set in order to play with somebody's figures. And, and I may be starting to get a little grumpy about this, but it does seem to me that what seems to happen when people buy IP is they use it as an excuse to write yet another set of rules to play with their own figures. If someone did a role-playing game based on The Witcher, mm. maybe I would be tempted to play that. Well... You could... I might go off on a rant here, be warned. <laughs> <laughs> there are any number of good generic fantasy role-playing systems out there which can be customised to fit a universe. That's Beautiful right. Work. The thing is, the thing is, with everything that we're talking about, really, there's enough stuff out there now that if you want to do it, you can go out there and do it yourself. The figures are freely available. You, there's just about everything you can possibly want to buy in one scale or another. Uh, it's the real... I mean... And the real I, systems are out there, aren't yeah. they? But there's from an mi- IP point of view, what there aren't out there is too many big killer things like Halo, where in order to get a game that looks right, you have to buy insane amounts of IP. You have to collaborate in with, with Microsoft. Yeah. There aren't too many other things like that around. I mean, for Vikings, yes, there are figures around. Even if there weren't, it's not beyond the wit of man to find half a dozen figures for the heroes that look roughly right and apply some green yeah. stuff. Mm. So there is a myriad of IP licenses out there that could be done and could be used, but in reality, actually, the markability of them probably isn't that high because you can just get off your own backside, buy the figures, and sort out a rule set that suits you and you know, tweak it to 
how you want it to be. Preach it, brother. Mm. Again, it comes down to the question of people who produce figures. You know, it, it's the not figures that you can yes. buy, as opposed to people who go out and actually buy an IP and produce the official figures for that because they've got the IP. And maybe that's because you need also you need a bit of an outside the war game fan base to make it actually yeah. worthwhile doing. Because yeah. war gamers, we've been model makers, we've been you know fudging things for years and working out how to get round systems before a lot of this stuff was commercially available at all. And the stuff that is sort of being produced nowadays that you know these big blockbuster IPs are are actually inviting people in that probably haven't come from that sort of background. Yeah, you, you tend to see a lot of um, collectible miniatures based on IP. So like like the Dark Sword ones for um, Game of Thrones, they're, they're being touted. I think they're a bigger size as well. I think they're about 54. They're, they're, no, they're, they're uh, heroic. Six. They're heroic 28, I think. Yeah, because yeah, uh, yeah, Annie stocks them. All from. together now, 32. 32, 32. Yeah. You know, they, they are being touted as collectible figures. For... And they're also bloody expensive if you want to build an army of them. Yeah. Hence, hence why they have Pardon the, my French. Have yeah, what's the, the collectible... first one? Two ninety nine. and then what was it after that? <laughs> 17 quid. <laughs> is, it, is it that much? It would surprise know. me. Uh, I, 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 imagine they're, I imagine they're probably, yeah, they're, you're looking at eight or nine pound a figure. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, and interesting. Interestingly, because the, the other thing is, is that you know, when people get then get hold of IPs, you know, it's it's not it's not just oh, what would you like to see? Is that then you know, can you please do something with it? Remember, do you remember all the hoo ha that went that went around when I forget the company that did it, but somebody uh, went went away and bought the IP for Stargate, and there was a whole hoo ha because there were two or three companies that produced not Stargate figures. Mm. and there were cease and desists flying around and everything else. Do you remember if anything was ever done with an official Stargate game? Because mm. I don't remember mm. it. And, and, talk, and talking of which, remember the uh, the big fanfare 12 months ago, maybe more, when Warlord bought the Doctor Who IP? Yeah, but that game is in production. It's out in September, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, I, I, I said I was. I was wondering because uh, yeah, because uh, he, he, he kind of gone quiet. I was just wondering what uh, wonder what was happening with it. Yeah, John but, Lamb's head. John uh, Lamb's okay, yeah, right in there. Well, um, okay, okay, so that's uh, that's in production. But but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's so, so. I mean, I mean, the Stargate one was a classic one because because there were two or three companies that did really nice, not figures, and then they were all issued with cease and desists when the, the, this, the, this one company bought the IP, and. I don't remember ever seeing anything anything official from it. No. And then obviously you've got other people, other companies that um, it's since gone. I mean, um, I think the classic. Oh well, yeah, we've already talked about Mongoose, Starship Troopers. Their Starship Troopers game. Uh, I mean, I must admit, I never pl- I never played the game. Uh, by all accounts, it was ve- it was good. It was written by Andy Chambers, wasn't it? Uh, it was very good. Uh, it was popular. They had a really good range of figures. They had some. They said they had some cracking aliens and the bugs and everything, and uh, of course that's that all. That all died. That's because they lost the license. Yes. What about the Babylon Five game? Lost the license. Lost the license. <laughs> I mean, they had both a yeah. compact game and an RPG. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going back to what we were saying about Game of Thrones, if you want to build, for example, a unit of Southern Westeros archers from Dark Sword, it's going to cost you ten bucks a figure. Oh. There are six different poses. But it's still going to cost you ten bucks a figure. You, you you don't need to be playing anything bigger than a skirmish game, do you? Well, no, that's the point at which you go. Oh, look, yet another box of, of gripping beast Dark Ages generic plastics. Yeah, yeah. See, tis Dark Ages. <laughs> yes, and just and just let's just kind of um, yes amend the paint scheme a little bit. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Let, let's be honest. If you were sufficiently inventive you you could use the the really nice all the tom mayer and jeff easley and all those other people's sculpts that the 113 different sculpts that 133 that dark sort of got you've got enough for any hero figures you might ever want but with a combination of gripping beast plastics 
Fireforge plastics, possibly Conquest Games plastics. You can probably produce all the armies. If the worst comes to the worst, you probably need to rope in a few uh, um, Games Workshop Lord of the Rings plastics. <gasps> Wrong scale. Oh, I suppose they are. They're near a 25. Yeah, on purpose. <laughs> if you remember. Oh, yes, that's that true. Was, that was the whole point with New Line. They, uh, <coughs> they had to produce them in a scale that wasn't compatible with anything else. Oh, joy. Thanks, guys. But, yeah, fundamentally, if you really wanted to do Games of Thrones, your hero figures are available from Dark Sword and well worth the money because they're absolutely beautiful sculpts. Uh, but you populate your armies from everybody's generic Dark Ages and medieval plastics. Life's a good one. There we go. I think I think we answered that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did. Let us know what you think anyway. Yes. Okay, next up. This is from John. Um, I haven't got a surname for him, uh, but this is John, and I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember when, when, when this was posted, but uh, okay. a long time ago. Long time. Oh, oh yeah, right. Okay, one fifty. Oh right. Okay. So, can gaming shops survive in the long term, and does it matter whether they do or they don't? Yes and yes. Mm. Possibly it, and yes. It's mm. an interesting. It's an interesting one. And does it? And and also because, uh, it. Does it matter which side of the Atlantic you are? I think, yeah. I mean, the question's quite loaded, isn't it? Um, in the UK, does it matter if gaming shops survive? Mm, it probably doesn't. But um, in America, it'd be a bit different, wouldn't it? I think gaming shops need to be more than just a gaming shop. Yeah, this is what I, the next thing I was going to say, Mike, is that yeah. They need to be, uh, especially in the UK. I mean, I can't comment. To, I mean, I have been to America, but I can't comment on exactly how the it's working. But I mean, in the UK, the high street is changing rapidly, uh, and your normal bricks and mortars shops are really struggling. And they've got to be more inventive on just selling stuff. It's got to be more of a leisure activity. And uh, I think I think that's where the gaming shops have got to go, and not like what we've just had in Leicester, uh, Mike, over the uh, and uh, Neil, should I say, in the last couple of years, where we've just had shops that rely on teenagers and youngsters buying um, the trading game cards. We've, they've got to really innovate and move further out mm. into sort of adult gaming, and you know maybe have I don't know if it's going to be financially viable, but you have a bar and you have somewhere where you can get hot food and, you know, you can eat at night. Nice one. <laughs> exactly. I was, was going to say, Hobbsy, do you know anywhere uh, that does that? Say, I know Hobbsy knows of one place that does, is very much like that. And when I heard about what they were doing, I thought, well, yeah, this is the way to go. Because you, you, you've you got to really try and diversify and appeal to as many people as possible. And selling figures and cards and everything isn't the only way to make money. If, if you look at what was happening at Games Workshop with their with the, the way that they've closed down their gaming shops, mm. uh, or they've made them one one manager only, haven't they? Yeah. So, like you say, I think having a high street gaming shop would probably just die in its ass. But if you look at the model of what Wayland and Firestorm are doing, where it's a venue, you know, it's a gaming venue that you go to that you know, happens to have a shop in, in you know, in, included. That does that model really works because you get people, you know, come in to to visit you instead of just walking by. Or, yeah. or conversely, a shop that can put in an appearance at a gaming venue. I know, almost friend of the show, Ruben, who runs P and Collectibles, brings his stall to the club every Monday night. Yeah, um, takes orders, has all those things that you ran out of over the weekend uh, because you were painting figures in stock and ready to hand. Um, and that, I think you have to... That's, that's far too dangerous for a club. Oh, it's very, very useful. <laughs> You've no idea how useful it is, mate. <laughs> it really, is... you don't. Does he sell super glue? Uh, yes. <laughs> Dave! Dave! <laughs> yeah. Yes, he sells super glue. But can you, particularly, can, he comes... Can you, get this, can you believe, can you believe that we're sat in Dave's lounge having a hobby night and uh, he knocks something off. He's like, Dave, we need super glue. And he goes, I- I've got your super glue. No. No. Got Aradite. Can you believe it? No, a war gamer. He's got no super glue a in the A war house. gamer with no super glue. It's quite sad, isn't it? Well, I'd run out. <laughs> I had got super glue, but it, it dried out. But, yeah, I mean, part of the point there is if, you know, it's, it's, if the mountain won't come to Muhammad, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. 
Um, and that I think to survive, you've got to be, you can't just be a shop. You've no. got to be in touch with the hobby. Mm. And look, it's quite interesting, the the um, the second Firestorm game uh, game shop, because they got two. Oh, yeah. Was it, yeah. Uh, uh, remind us, whether, is it, was it Newport, the second one? Yeah, the second one's in Newport, and it's in a Tesco Extra. It's really? actually Yeah, so li- literally, you, massive great Tesco's. And where the tills are in Tesco's opposite, there's a bunch of shop areas. You know, normally you have like a travel agent, a travel agent in there. But no, five summer in there, right opposite the tills. Doing, I mean, they do mostly card games, board games, model kits. So it's appealing to, unfortunately, um, for the people in Newport, young kids who have gone shopping with their parents. It's like, oh, can we go in here, please, Dad? And, you know, that, you know, so that, you know <laughs> So they would have things like Sabutio and Monopoly, but they've also got Games Workshop, all the figure paint, you know, all the stuff that they do in, in the normal Firestorm is in there, plus all this extra stuff. So maybe that's another way of doing it. But again, it's it's appeal. It's, it, if you're going to have a shop, you've got to make sure you've got your demographic right and you're there appealing to whoever's there. But that's a, that, that, that was a really risky thing, I think, that he, mm. uh, Bob did when he opened that. But it's going really well. And the thought of having a, a, a war game shop actually in a supermarket. Yeah, that is that is that is quite, that is quite strange. But, but again, as you say, it, it's an interesting question in the in the fact of the way, uh, and yeah, we've had this conversation backwards and forwards several times now on the show. It is an interesting question, as you say, whether it was loaded or not. About uh, you know, with the difference between the UK and the US, and as I say, it's a subject we 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 touched on many times, and and the whole thing surrounding gaming shops and their difference, and yeah, maybe they are more, more the hobby centre when it comes down to the US mm. as opposed to the UK, and it is interesting how many game stores we've seen in the UK start up and then die normally it's normally it's because they, they just rely on the trading game side of it doesn't it? the trading cards generally yeah but trading cards are a massive market yeah you, you get um, we have um, yeah. really- it is a massive market but it isn't the only source of income no no, no you and if it, have we have Rift in Peterborough who you may remember sponsored a couple of tournaments at Harrowwood um, who stopped Trading cards, board games, they run trading card nights and competitions nearly every weekend with manufacturer support, and they're doing fine. Mm. But yeah, you've, you've got to cover all your bases. But it, it's a risky one just having a, a pure gaming shop. Mm. Well, the more, if, you've got, if you've got a building, you, you know, a, a bricks and mortar building, really, you, you've just got to. You've got to maximise because you're there. You're there. You've got the building. You're paying the rent, or you've bought the rent, or whatever. Whatever you're doing, you put the investment in there. So you've got to maximise the amount of money you can get on every level. You know whether that's selling Mars bars, a curry, a beer. You know competitions on a Sunday. You know everything. You, you know just selling cards. I think and that's. I mean, I don't know. I think. I think maybe you know to American listeners, this is going to feel sound quite strange because they're probably saying well you know my club's been doing that for years but in the uk we have you know our, our gaming clubs a lot of them haven't been doing it have they no um you, you don't see it at all you you just see it, it always used to be there was a shop where you go and buy your stuff and then you have your club mm. now we're starting to see maybe it, maybe it is the american model coming over but now you're starting to see you know, like wayland and even your club mike is is you know a sort of proto one of that is well, you've got the two in- combined. I think only, the clubs- only, only, ver- only very recently, and, yeah. and we could go further. But yeah, I, I mean, if the- you con- if you contrast that with when I was last in Seattle, was board game hunting, and um, popped into Gamma Ray Games. So I know we have some Seattle-based listeners who will probably recognise the store. We walked in there, and there was a full-fledged. I can't what it was. I think it was. It was one of the competitive board game tournaments going on and and judging from the information on their on their walls they had something going on just about every night of the week every weekend daytime you know so the second part of this question was does it matter if they do survive yes 
Yeah. Why? <laughs> because it introduced you to new games. <sighs> but, 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 but surely that's what the internet's for. Mm. Yeah, but there's something very... But we're in a, a very tactile hobby. You know, we like to see stuff. We like to pick it up. We like to have a look at the blisters. We like to, you know... Yeah. So, so, so why is Kickstarter so um, so popular then, uh, Mike? <laughs> What's tactile about Kickstarter? Oh, okay. Nothing Sorry, I'm tactile. being argumentative, but I'm I just going to get out there. Tactile about about Kickstarter, and yeah, it is a big one for buy, you know, for getting people to froffed up about it. But there is always a place, you know. There's always a need, I think. For seeing new things in the flesh, you know the number yeah, of times. Not everybody. Off. I mean, people tend to get ooh shiny itis out of Kickstarter, and it's not always about the gameplay. Quite often, it's just about the figures. Whereas you get, I'm sure it happens as much of Fast Home as it does with you. Fast Home have things they want to sell that's new that's coming out, so they will make the effort to put on a demo game so people can see a gets people interested in the new game. Um, gets people not always playing the same things. B, they sell stuff. Yeah, and you know things sell off each other. You know, well, and it's it's not like things ever fall from Firestorm's shelves into your hands. Obviously. Oh no, never. Which never. would uh, never happen on the internet. But also, it, it, it's it's the the variety of products you can get in the shop. Oh. I mean, okay, yeah, you can go online, and if I need paint, I can go online and order some paint. But if I need paint and flock and glue and a blister of something else, do I, you know, is it easier for me to go to one shop and buy it all there or go to five different shops on the, you know, on the web and pay for five different lots of postage? Or do I have to wait until I got enough where it actually makes worthwhile doing a bigger order on, online just to cut down on the postage costs? It is an interesting one, isn't it? And again, this is, uh, I suppose this, this fires the questions that we get sometimes uh, about the fixation that we Brits seem to have with shopping in our shows. We do like a good shop, don't we? I, I think. I think well, the thing yeah. is, is that the hobby surrounding the UK scene is very much different because clubs really came first, and then and then the gaming shops came sort of afterwards. Because back in the day, you were buying stuff from guys at shows at you know, did it out of a garage or the back of a shed? Oh, you were buying it from you, you were buying it from Games Workshop in the days before they only did only, only did Space Marines. And I, I think where the shops then the shops came about and the shops sort of did well for a while and then some of them failed. And then more or less, I mean, we've had this conversation, didn't we, before Neil? That that more or less, virtually, there was hardly any shop at all in the UK. Was the left at one point? What outside of a Games Workshop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm. and, it, it, it certainly it, it certainly seemed like that at one point. And it seems that you know there's a few people out there that have suddenly just grasped the nettle and gone. You know, we'll have a club, but it'll be a shop. You know, <coughs> and we'll, we'll we'll run games and we'll do everything we can to make it worthwhile. People actually spending physical time within the shop, and you know, we'll we'll charge them by hook or by crook uh, for that time. No, we all gone. <laughs> Sorry, we're just listening to you dying, Dave. Yeah. Sorry, I got a, I got a, a bit of a nip in my throat. Then could, could you, could you not possibly die on mute, mate? Just, just <laughs> so our listeners don't write in a concerned manner. <laughs> I, I couldn't mute it quick enough. We got time for another question, or should we close the mailbag? <laughs> um, I must admit, because the next question is quite a biggie anyway, and we have been recording for forty minutes. Yeah. To think the usual fifteen-minute mailbag, then. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, we we'll just spent fifteen minutes on this. So. Spot on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's a minute to ten, which seems to me like a good spot to wrap it. Indeed. Well, I think on on that note, I think uh, we'll close the mailbag for uh, another show before uh, Dave dies. Above for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you what, I didn't have this cough until um, until I came on here. You know, I was, I've been fine all day. Oh, in that case, then you must have caught it off me while we've been on air. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Hey, uh, hey, hey, this doesn't mean our gaming tomorrow night's off, does it? Yeah, yeah, cancel. Oh no! <laughs> For another no. week. Oh, I know, yeah, I know. I know of at least one follower on Twitter who will be gutted. 
Yeah. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> His Wednesday nights must be really boring. <laughs> <laughs> His Wednesday, Wednesday. What do you mean Thursdays? Oh yeah, it'd be Thursday as well, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, we used to work. We used to game on a Wednesday, didn't we? And then you moved it to Thursday. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> point the point. Okay, so uh, thank you to, uh, to to for once again sending in your questions. Uh, obviously, uh, and as I said at the start of this, you know, if there's any, if you have any questions for us, please uh, send them in. We'll um, you know we'll uh, I'll, I'll, next time I'll remember to to put some posts up on the Facebook page and I'll remind people on Twitter. Uh, and what have you but yeah it's info at meeples and miniatures uh, and that will be dot co dot uk sorry thank you <laughs> info at meeples and miniatures dot co dot uk is cool. the email address can't get anyone to run a podcast these days indeed and, and please can you put mailbag in the subject because that at least will highlight it amongst, hey uh, Neil I've just had this really cool idea What's that then? Why don't we create mailbag at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk for people to mail mailbag questions to? I suppose we could. Indeed. Okay, that's a okay. That's a job for me to do. Look out for the change of email address. Hold that thought, guys, and um, I will publicise the email address. In fact, scrub that. <laughs> I'll do it for the time this show comes out. <laughs> so, <laughs> by the by, the magic of podcasting, uh, send your mailbag questions into mailbag at meeplesandminiatures dot co dot uk. Okay, so that's mailbag at meeplesandminiatures dot co dot uk. We are slow, but we are mighty. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there in the end. It's a bit uh, scary when there's three IT blokes on here. <laughs> we get there in the end. Yeah, we get there eventually. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you once again for your questions and uh, we'll, we will uh, catch up with you once again on the mailbag soon. Well, there we have it. I think uh, uh, I think that about wraps it up for another show, doesn't it, guys? Might be a record so. short show on recent forms. Or maybe not. There were hours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes. I, I mean, given uh, the fact that we're recording this one before I've actually edited it, um, but yes, we, we are roughly slightly shorter than we were uh, on, on our last two or three, but uh, but hopefully um, still. Full of useful con, full of useful and interesting content. So, uh, thank you to everybody who has uh, been giving us feedback. Thank you to everyone who downloaded the previous show. Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, I, I must admit that that took off. Uh, I mean, the fact that basically uh, it had mo- as many downloads in three days as we normally get in the space of like a week and a half. Um, obviously, people were were keen to listen to it and um, had several people who uh, who I think were actually quite surprised with uh, uh, the interview with uh, with Kirsty Rogers, which is yep. which is nice. Yes. Yep. So, uh, but no, 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 thank you to everybody, and uh, yeah, yeah, hope you have enjoyed this show as well. Oh, I'm just trying to think. What have you got coming next, guys? Mister Hobbs, you organise this. Next. next up, we have an interview with. Ruby Jenkins about Horizon Wars. Ah, oh, that's yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing next. Indeed, yes, yes. So it's um, so the next show is interview with Ruby Jenkins and also a review of the rules. Um, indeed, indeed. That's the usual. Yes, what we've been up to. Banter and merriment. Lots of banter and merriment. Indeed, and uh, and so that is going to be due out. Uh, oh. Um, <laughs> April the 15th. April the 15th. So you'll get a chance to listen to it on the way to salute. Woohoo. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Salute is on, uh, salute is only two weeks away at the so, point where you're <laughs> listening to this. Get your pre-orders in now and start saving your money. Indeed. And I'll think I, I, of all and of get a pair of new shoes because you're going to need them. <laughs> And it might be the case of I'm the only one of the crew that's there by the sound of things. 
<clears throat> I don't know at the moment. Uh, we'll see. Um, the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm off to Leeds, I'm off to Leeds the following week. Uh, it's a question of how many how many exit passes I'm allowed. I like. I have my tickets. I have my tickets. So I'm definitely getting. Ah, uh, you see. So, so yeah. there we go. As I say, we'll catch up with you again in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we'll talk about all about Horizon Worlds. Uh, but in the meantime, up until then, it remains for me to say, uh, well, first off, um, thank you for, uh, to, uh, Dave Luff for swiftly popping in on the show. Uh, always nice to yep. have, uh, always nice to chat to Dave. And, and thank you to Messrs, uh, Hobbs and Whitaker. Thank you, sirs. You're welcome. Thank you. Until next time, uh, happy gaming, take care, and we'll speak to you soon. This Bye. has been the Meeple of Miniatures production. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at Miniatures. Dot co dot uk. And you can also visit our webpage, where you'll find a complete episode archive, all the View from the Veranda podcasts, rules reviews, and our blog of hobby items and news, which is updated several times a week. This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media. And here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group. And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.